The Board of Regents of the University of Minnesota <coughs> meeting on Friday, September 9, 2011, is called to order. We will have the first item on the agenda, which is the approval of the minutes. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank second. you. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any changes or corrections? If there are none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> motion carries. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a report from our president, um, our soon-to-be inaugurated president, who has spent a whirlwind 70 days in his job and uh, shown a lot of energy and a lot of wisdom and sense of humor. President Kaler. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning. Uh, it has indeed been a great pleasure for me to work with you in preparing for what is truly my first hands-on uh, board meeting. I think it is fair to say I was still getting my feet wet uh, at our first meeting in July, uh, but since then, uh, from Farm Fest to the uh, opening go for football game and from visits to coordinate campuses to meetings with the state business leaders, I feel like I've been moving too fast for my feet to even get wet. Uh, highlights of my first 10 weeks on this marvelous job uh, include the following. Uh, first, the restoration of uh, $25 million per year over the next two years to our budget. Uh, we're thankful to Governor Dayton and the legislature for that. I will be ad addressing the details uh, of our response to that opportunity later this morning. Let me just say that budgets are not only about numbers. They are about values, too. I do hope that my recommendations demonstrate to you and others my priorities and principles, which underscore three key themes. First, reducing the burden of tuition on students and families. Second, investing in graduate education to improve quality and degree to completion. And third, to make strategic investments to drive overall excellence at the university. It's been a great honor every day to come to work and look under the hood of this gigantic economic, education, and cultural engine that we call the U. But during my short tenure, there's not yet been any greater honor than being part of announcing an extraordinary $14 million gift from the estate of Myrtle Stroud to the College of Liberal Arts. And you see on your screen a photograph of Charles and Myrtle Stroud. Ms. Stroud, a longtime resident of Wyndham, Minnesota, died last year at the age of 101. In memory of her husband and herself, she gave to the U the largest single gift for scholarships in our history. Such generosity and foresight are an inspiration and, frankly, quite moving to me. Her gift motivates us even more to work tirelessly to increase private philanthropy to the U. At about the same time, we learned that the School of Dentistry received a $3.5 million gift from Delta Dental of Minnesota Trust to support the construction of the state, state's only hospital-based pediatric dental clinic and the most advanced pediatric dental clinic in the upper Midwest. The clinic will be located adjacent to the new Amplas Children's Hospital. Meanwhile, pediatric cancer epidemiologist Jen Pointer was awarded a five-year, $3.5 million grant from the National Institutes of Health to study pediatric germ cell tumors, a groundbreaking area of research for which the university has long been known. We offer our congratulations to Dr. Pointer. An area in, that we have come to know uh, and own, namely food safety, researchers at the College of Food, Agricultural, and Natural Resource Sciences have discovered and received a patent for what is a naturally occurring antibiotic that could be added to food to kill harmful bacteria. Salmonella and E. coli account for more than half of the food recalls in the United States, and this breakthrough could reduce those dramatically. Meanwhile, in another area that's critical to our commitment to Minnesota's changing demographics and health care needs, we receive funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to study the incidence of autism within the Somali community in Minneapolis. In the science of words, our newly appointed state poet laureate, Joyce Stufflet, happens to be a three-time U alum. With her BA, Master's, and PhD, we have every rhyme and good reason to claim her. In Rochester, a new housing community for our growing campus opened on August 25th, and some of you were there. It's a milestone for UMR. Enrollment is up but on all but one of our coordinate campuses. We have a very successful year. Our incoming class of 2015 on the Twin Cities campus is, by all measures, the best qualified group of freshmen in U history. We had 40,000 applications, and we enrolled 5,378 students. They have the highest ACT scores ever, the most National Merit Scholars ever, and we believe when the dust settles, we will have the most National Merit Scholars among public universities in the Big Ten. Now, some people wonder, and I dare say complain, 
quote, my son or daughter, my grandson or granddaughter didn't get into the U. How come? The fact is, we simply cannot admit many students for whom we would have had admit a place in the past. Nor, frankly, can we admit every qualified student. With 40,000 applications for 5,300 slots, it's just not possible. We're becoming a much more selective university and a much more challenging university for admission. While it's difficult for any individual student who's had his or her sights set on the U, this increased selectivity is good for the institution overall. It bodes well for our retention and graduation rates, our ability to attract the best faculty and graduate students, and the value of a U of M degree over the long run. I do want to emphasize, though, that this selectivity is not coming at the expense of Minnesota students. The fact is that we're not turning down Minnesota students in favor of out-of-state or international students. This year, 63.5% of our freshmen graduated from a Minnesota high school, and that percentage has pretty much held steady over the past decade, as that graphic in front of you shows. As our selectivity continues to increase, it's my long-term commitment to clearly articulate to Minnesota students and families what it takes to be successful at the U. I will work with K-12 leaders to develop a path for success for all of our students. I've begun conversations with Minsky Chancellor Stephen Rosenstone, a friend of many of yours, to get our arms around the pressing issue of college readiness and to collaborate more fully to serve students moving between our institutions. Steve and I appeared together to speak with the board of the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce and we're co-authoring a piece for the Chamber's newsletter. In the end, for me, it's difficult to argue against excellence. I'm committed to a University of Minnesota known for excellence. That will demand excellent students and for that I'm not apologetic and you will hear more about this during my inaugural speech on the 22nd of this month. The full week of planned festivities around the inauguration are not about me. I see the inauguration as a vehicle to instill and promote pride in this great university. My goal is to leverage the inaugural period to touch base with a wide range of stakeholders and to continue to engage students and make sure they are being heard. In other news, Provost Sullivan has appointed a search committee for the Dean of the Carlson School of Management and our search for a new provost is moving quickly. We have also established a search committee uh, for the Dean of Dentistry. Uh, in the provost search, we have a robust and impressive pool of candidates who will be bringing to campus over the next two weeks. As you all know, in these searches, it can be terribly difficult to balance our commitment to a transparent and open process with the candidates' needs to remain confidential for as long as possible. It was a challenge, as you well remember, when you hired me, and it's a challenge in this provost search. I'm very pleased with the diversity of our pool of candidates, and hopefully they will all continue through the public phase of the search. One of the key priorities on your list when I was appointed was that this great university wasn't getting the word out about our extraordinary accomplishment systems wide. We're working hard at telling our story, and of course I believe it's a spectacular one. Our goal is to both engage the mainstream media and to use all the platform of social media to deliver our key messages. We're seeking excellence in all we do, and we're determined to ensure access for all qualified students. We're also determined to see our four-year graduation rate improve, uh, a message I took straight to our first-year students with my tattoo. As you know, since taking office in July, I've been moving around the state to get our message out face-to-face -to, -face to listen and learn. I have been to Brainerd, Crookston, Delano, Lamberton, Marshall, Morris, New Ulm, Owatonna, Redwood Falls, Rosemont, Stillwater, Worthington, the farthest reaches of the Twin City, the special place known as the State Fair, and the western enclave of Minnesota Gopher Support, Los Angeles, where we had over 1,200 uh, Gopher friends uh, for the pregame football. Along the way, perhaps uh, besides chatting with hundreds of Minnesotans, I've had the pleasure of communicating with a series of mostly friendly counter clerks at Dairy Queen. Thankfully, Dairy Queen is a Minnesota company and a huge friend of the U. The Vice Chair of the University of Minnesota Foundation is former Dairy Queen CEO Chuck Moody. My new, goal is to finish, uh, is, my new goal is to visit the local Dairy Queen everywhere I go. And it'll be fun. I'll post my progress on the web. And for you, each of you will have a special after lunch treat, which is a dilly bar. And you'll see here. I may enjoy mine during the meeting. <laughs> I'll stop here because I always stop at Dairy Queen. It's been a whirlwind and productive time for me. And I appreciate very much uh, your help during this uh, early stage of my presidency and your continued support. Thank you. Thank you, President Kaler, for a dilly of a report. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Are there any questions or comments from members of the board? <laughs> Regent Johnson. That is a wonderful question, but uh, <laughs> I frequent them too. <laughs> any that are, other? That are open year round or just during the summer? <laughs> Mr. Any yeah. other questions or comments? Thank you again for that wonderful report. The next item is the report of the chair. Um, I am bringing forward a resolution to amend the board meeting dates that we selected in June of this year. By this resolution, we will not meet in November, listed as tentative on the new schedule in case of emergency, and in April meeting, which we have not held for a number of years. The total number of meetings is reduced from nine to eight. The purpose of this change is twofold. To focus our attention on the most strategic issues and also because we are in a time where we are trying to do more with less to reduce the administrative burden. Is there a motion for this new schedule? Thank you, is there second and second? It's been moved and second. Is there any discussion? If, yes, Regent Johnson. Madam Chair, um, I think it's very important and uh, with our new president coming in and his staff in part made the request that we uh, lessen the number of, of board meetings because it's very time consuming for the president and the entire administration. And what, what you have said, uh, Madam Chair, is to do more with less, and uh, we respect the new president's uh, wishes and uh, wholeheartedly support uh, this motion. It's not that we're going to do less work as a board and uh, lessen the, the burdens of, uh, of uh, being a, a regent, but I think for the public it's very important to know it's an efficiency, if you will, on behalf of the university administration and board. So I think it's a very, very good uh, uh, initiative and that we ought to support. Thank you, Regent Johnson. And the process also was consulting with each of the board's committee chairs in order to make sure that they could get the work that they need to do done. And again, they are going to focus on more strategic issues also. So uh, it's been moved and seconded. If there's no further discussion, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. And uh, any opposed? The motion carries. It has been delightful in these first 70 days, as I mentioned, uh, of President Kaler's tenure to see the joy and energy he brings to the position and to observe him visit the state. A number of regents, Regents Johnson, Ramirez, and Allen, had the opportunity to join him on some of these visits, and there will be more visits in the months ahead. And now, I just want to show you, I have my prop too. Uh, this is some of the coverage in the agri news uh, of President Kaler uh, when he was visiting in different parts of the state. A number of regents will travel with the Gopher football team to the Michigan game on October 1st to cheer our football team on. And the next meeting of the board will be October 13th and 14th on the Twin Cities campus. That's the end of the chair's report. Any questions or comments? If not, we will receive and file reports which are on pages 55 to 65 of your docket materials. The next item is the consent report, um, which is on pages 66 to 88 of the docket. <clears throat> is there a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda? Thank you and it's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion about the items on the consent agenda? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. And any opposed? Motion carries. The next item is the report of the Faculty Consultative Committee. And Professor Kramer, please come to the table and we welcome you, welcome to a new academic year. Thank you very much. Chair Cohen, Vice Chair Larson, members of the board, and President Kaler, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to update you on the activities of the Faculty Consultative Committee since our last report in June and to offer you an outline of our plans for the coming academic year. 
And now having read verbatim that first sentence, I hate reading verbatim something you've got written down. That seems kind of silly. So except for those parts where my writing is so eloquent, I can't possibly improve upon it extempore. I'll try to uh, be a little bit more overview in this. Uh, with respect to our activities in the last quarter, we had a chance to meet with President Kaler for the first time. That was delightful. We had a lively discussion. FCC always has lively discussions, but particularly with the President. Uh, and we are looking forward to uh, working with him in uh, all of the initiatives proposed by his administration, as well as those that bubble up from the faculty. Of course, efficiency is the buzzword of the year. And I'm reminded of a Garrison Keillor joke at some point of a bachelor farmer, and I'll leave out all the other adjectives that might specify ethnicity or sex or anything, but who said, you know, I just had those cows giving milk and getting no food at all, and then they up and died on me. So you can't carry efficiency too far, obviously, <laughs> but efficiency is the buzzword, and we're very interested in that. Uh, it turns out that the Senate Committee on Finance and Planning, in fact, last year had initiated a process of a uh, Audit is too strong a word, but learning about all of the various vice presidential units within the uh, university, their scope, their mission, and uh, their budgets, and is in the late stages of completing a report on that uh, process, uh, several retreats where they talk to the various vice presidents. And uh, we'll be delivering that report to the administration. Hopefully that will prove useful as one other uh, piece of information that the president uh, can use in making decisions about administrative structure as we move forward. We've also heard a report on gender equity in uh, faculty salaries that uh, was initiated by Provost Sullivan. Uh, a consultant was uh, brought in after an internal study. Uh, the consultant has delivered a report now to the university, and we've discussed with the provost the contents of that report and are looking forward to continuing to work with him and uh, relevant constituencies within the university on potential remedies where they might be warranted. And uh, certainly we believe that equity is a signal priority for compensation decisions at the university in general. Uh, we held our retreat at the end of August, as we always do. We discussed a number of topics. Uh, one was faculty accountability and productivity. So uh, after efficiency, productivity is probably the next buzzword. And I would say, I'm going to go now to my eloquent writing, much of the debate on faculty accountability and productivity has been depressingly ill-informed around the country with respect to what faculty members actually do and how their wide array of scholarly, professional, and artistic activities contribute to the research, teaching, and public engagement missions of an institution like the University of Minnesota. And now I'll admit that part of that is faculty's own fault because we're fabulously bad at finding the time to communicate to external constituencies exactly what we do. So we hope we're going to be able to do better with that and help the administration do better about uh, that kind of public engagement of, of what does happen at the university. Uh, and I'll note that many of the things that faculty do cannot and should not naively be reduced to a single dollar and cents value. And our goal is to move the debate beyond cynical sound bites to a more informed and informative plane. We talked about graduate and professional education and uh, the developments taking place there as uh, Dean Schroeder continues to work with relevant faculty committees to uh, change the structure of graduate education, to right size it in certain instances, and to align its funding with uh, the programs that we have and determine their quality based on metrics. I think this is an opportunity the university has to really be a leader. The surveys that have been done of other schools and how they manage their graduate education illustrates that many other places are facing these same questions and don't necessarily have all the answers yet either. And if we get out in front and help to provide them uh, good information, that'll be useful. Along those lines, we talked about enrollment management, which uh, covered both undergraduate and graduate education. Again, looking at uh, tuition incomes, demand for certain programs, and what quality metrics should be used to, to judge them. We had a chance to discuss equity, diversity, and climate with relevant uh, officers from the provost's office. Uh, information technology with uh, interim chief information officer, Ann Hildoon. Uh, certainly IT is the backbone through which many enterprise systems at the U communicate and making sure that that is smooth and uh, efficient, I hate to use that word, is uh, a good thing. So we talked about uh, what opportunities might be there. We heard from uh, Vice President Fitzenreuter who was in an unusually sunny mood as uh, he was able to describe to us how we were sucking up a huge cut as opposed to a really devastatingly huge cut. So that was good. It was kind of like getting money back. Uh, and we discussed what the implications would be for the budget moving forward. Uh, and finally, uh, 
Vice President Brown came and chatted with us about uh, strategic plans that are just uh, being undertaken in the uh, Office of Human Resources to come up with career paths and career ladders that are not yet in place necessarily for professional administrative staff, which will be useful not only from a, a development standpoint of personnel, but also perhaps to help again in communicating to the outside world, what do all those people at the university do? Each person seems to have an important job, but in the, when you put them all together, somehow it becomes a nebulous bunch of administrators and there's bloat. Uh, and finally, we of course uh, invited President Kaler and Provost Sullivan, and as I say, a productive time was had by all in those discussions, again, lively. I, I want to finish perhaps by mentioning two other significant issues that the faculty are going to try to address this year. Uh, one is a, a charge I've given to the uh, Senate Committee on Educational Policy, and that has to do with grading at the university. So grades are a, a kind of a complex issue. You, you know, if you, if you like the business aspect of analyzing things, you could ask, who's the customer for a grade? Is it the student? Is it someone who's going to read that student's transcript later on because they're looking at another program or they're applying for a job? Is it an accreditation agency that expects us to hold certain standards when it comes to grading? Uh, and it's quite clear that across the university, there may be different answers to those questions and there may be different customers for the uh, grading. And uh, given a disparity in some of the levels in different colleges and different units, uh, it's appropriate at this stage to take a look at that and ask who are the customers, what are our professional obligations to them, and what does a grade mean? Could we make transcripts a little more informative than just B? That's the one letter. It's kind of hard to get a lot of information out of one letter. B, and everybody got a B, lots of people got an A. So uh, that is ongoing. Academic Freedom and Tenure is planning to deliver a report this fall summarizing its work over the last calendar year, which was undertaken with Provost Sullivan, a very detailed report about academic freedom. To whom does it apply at the university? What are its limits? What are its uh, extents? Uh, and what's its value, actually? So. Uh, I'm going to go back to my good writing. AF&T will articulate that academic freedom is a privilege that comes with important responsibilities to both the internal and external constituencies that must be relied upon to protect it. Uh, AF&T also plans this year to examine the procedures associated with uh, post-tenure review to ensure that they are currently best serving both faculty members and the institution as a whole. So. Uh, my last paragraph is really well written, too, so I, I hope you'll forgive me if I just read it. read it. Permit me to close by noting that among the many reasons to love Minnesota, one we all know is that the state has four, count them four, seasons, but only academics are lucky enough to have an equally satisfying set of annual seasons disjoint from those of the solar calendar running simultaneously. With summer weather waning around us, well, not really, it's 85 today, I understand. But anyway, nevertheless, we can revel in the energy and excitement of academic spring, the start of a new school year that is even now bursting all around. New students, new colleagues, a new president. I still thrill every year at this time, notwithstanding my depressingly diminished ability to distinguish new faculty hires from graduate students. <laughs> And I hope that you, too, are finding it hard to sit still in the face of all the wonderful possibilities that lie before us in the coming months. My faculty colleagues and I, in collaboration with the board, the administration, and all of the other members of the university community, look forward with enthusiasm to a new year of sustaining and advancing the university's unswerving commitment to excellence and working together to communicate the university's inestimable value to the state and all its citizens. That completes my report. Thank you very, very much, Professor Kramer. Uh, you made some really uh, interesting and important points. One of the things that is very valuable to this university, I think, is the shared governance that we have, and as you mentioned, the collaboration. Are there questions or comments from the board? Regent Broad. Madam Chair and uh, Professor Kramer, I think um, I, you make chemistry interesting, I think, for your students. Mm -hmm. Depends which ones you ask. <laughs> the ones with the B or the A. Probably. Yeah, yeah, the A's love it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, the words efficiency, you mentioned a couple times, and I, I too agree that those words are overworked and overused. And so I'm hoping that maybe at your next meeting you can come up with some new words. If anybody can do it, I'm sure you can. I will take that as a personal challenge. Thank you. Any others? Thank you very much, Professor Kramer. And uh, we wish you well in the beginning of this springtime of academia. The next item is the Board of Regents policy. And this policy is in front of us for student representatives to the Board of Regents. 
the policy is in front of us both for review and action today to add a student representative to the Board of Regents from the Rochester campus. It is another sign of the growth and strength of our newest campus. Is there a motion to, uh, for this resolution? Thank you. Is there a second? Thank, thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, is there, are there any questions or comments about this resolution to add a student representative uh, from Rochester to the student representatives on the board, uh, to the board? Regent Hung. Madam Chair, I just want to add that I'm really glad that we're making this official and adding the student rep from the Rochester campus given that they've been around since 2006. So congratulations to the new student rep. All right, anything else? Regent Johnson. Madam Chair, before the board uh, meeting convened, the last person that I had opportunity to meet, I believe, is the new student rep from Rochester. And maybe you were going to introduce this individual. But if this motion passes, I think it'd be well to uh, recognize the new student rep who's sitting in the audience. All right, uh, what a good suggestion, Regent Johnson. Uh, Anything else? Then all those in favor of the, re of the resolution, please say aye. Aye. And opposed? All right, we have a new student rep to the board from Rochester, and it, I believe it's Maddie Hammerlin, so she's waving to us from back there. Well, welcome. She had joined, I think, both of the committees that I was on yesterday, and we certainly were glad to have her, at least one I know for sure. Uh, the next item is um, the amendment to the annual operating budget, and it will be President Kaler and Vice President Fitzenreiter. President Kaler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would like to uh, make that report uh, to you now, and the amendments that we offer are in keeping with the board's framework of last June. Uh, before I took office, uh, you faced uh, a, a scenario of tuition increases and programmatic and administrative uh, reductions that were substantial and severe. Uh, thankfully, uh, Governor Dayton and the legislature, res legislature restored some funding uh, to us. Uh, however, uh, lest you think this is all good news, we are still operating uh, with a 7.8 percent reduction uh, in budget from, uh, from last year, and we are indeed doing uh, more with substantially less. Uh, this gives me, however, an opportunity to present uh, some good news. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, it is more, uh, it is about more than numbers. It does reflect uh, my values and, and priorities. I often say that if you want to understand an institution's strategic plan, you simply must look at its budget. And these budget numbers, I think, give a clear indication of the direction I would like to go. Uh, we ask uh, students to help shoulder the burden of budget reductions, and it's only fair that we take a proportional share uh, of this uh, funding increase uh, to return uh, to students and uh, ameliorate uh, the tuition increases uh, to the greatest degree we can, and I will continue uh, to work to uh, maintain uh, increases as, as low as possible uh, for this university. Let me now walk you uh, through the, the amendments. I will, will do this, uh, and of course, uh, Vice President uh, Fitzenreiter will uh, correct it, the most egregious errors that, uh, that I make. Um, the the uh, amendments are described in, the, in text beginning on page uh, 99 of your, uh, of your briefing book. Uh, this uh, deck of slides will uh, simply highlight the changes. Uh, in fiscal 12, uh, the budget was built uh, estimating uh, $520 million in, in funding. Uh, we received an additional $50 million spread over the biennium. Uh, it is most instructive to think of that as a $25 million base uh, increment in each of the two years, which brings our state appropriation uh, to $545 million in each year of the biennium. The strategy uh, that uh, I worked through with my administrative team uh, is, as I mentioned, to adhere closely to the original framework. Uh, we are, however, uh, being prudent to maintain as much flexibility uh, as we can for FY13. Uh, that is in anticipation of, uh, of the potential of budget reductions, uh, and it also allows us uh, time uh, to carefully allocate uh, those investments in, in FY13. Uh, we're going to allocate approximately one-third of the recurring funds, one-third of $25 million, however, in this fiscal year uh, to meet critical academic needs that I will describe to you. 
will use a portion of the FY12 funds uh, on a non-recurring basis uh, to provide student relief in the spring uh, semester to students in the U Promise program. And finally, we will deliver uh, one-third of the recurring funds, which is $8.3 million in FY13, to lower uh, the pro projected uh, tuition increase uh, for all Minnesota undergraduate students. Uh, and finally, we'll use the remaining one-third uh, for strategic investments in 13. Uh, to, to summarize those, uh, those numbers, the $25 million in FY12 uh, will be spent uh, with $8.15 million of recurring allocations, uh, non-recurring allocations of $10.75 million, and that leaves a carry forward into FY13 of $6.1 million uh, as a uh, safety net, if you will. So this slide summarizes the recurring and non-recurring uh, allocations. The $8.15 million uh, recurring are, is allocated as follows. Uh, $4 million for new faculty hires. Uh, those uh, in response to a, a study of size and scope uh, will uh, be in uh, the science, technology, engineering, mathematics areas, the so-called STEM areas, uh, science and engineering and college biological sciences, uh, approximately 15 to 16 new faculty there. Uh, up to 10 new faculty members in the College of Liberal Arts and five new faculty members in the, in the Carlson School of uh, Management. Uh, these address strategic opportunities for uh, research advancement as well as recognize the uh, increased uh, enrollment and teaching burdens in those areas. Uh, the medical education and research cost uh, pool was uh, cut uh, by the state. Uh, we intend to repair some of that damage, uh, $3.05 million, uh, to uh, uh, eliminate uh, some of the damage caused by that reduction. Uh, $2 million of that will go to the School of Dentistry, uh, $700,000 to the Community University Health Care Center, $200,000 to the Area Health Education Center, and $150,000 uh, to the medical school to, uh, imp uh, to maintain the foreign trainee a program which trains uh, doctors who can practice medicine uh, abroad to practice medicine uh, in Minnesota. We'll provide $800,000 uh, in partial relief of uh, the veterinary diagnostic lab, which is an important part of our um, uh, land grant mission. $150,000 to support undergraduate research opportunities. This will provide uh, 100 additional uh, scholarships, uh, bringing the total to uh, 900 uh, for uh, system-wide uh, for undergraduates to partake in research opportunities with faculty. Uh, and uh, $150,000 to uh, correct a budgetary allocation uh, we've made improperly uh, to the College of Pharmacy. The non-recurring allocations uh, are, are as follows. Uh, $4.15 million uh, for one-time scholarships for undergraduate students eligible for the U Promise program. Those will be in the spring of uh, 12. Six million dollars will be set aside to be spent over three years for an important program that enriches the scholarship and improves the time to degree and completion rates of our graduate students. These doctoral dissertation fellowships are competitively awarded uh, and uh, make a real difference in, uh, in our uh, progress uh, and the progress of graduate students, which is, of course, a central part of our research um, mission. Uh, three and a half, uh, I'm sorry, $350,000 to assist uh, the Morris campus to bring their uh, electronic network uh, up to uh, the standards of the rest of the system, and uh, $250,000 uh, to uh, address a variety of uh, educational uh, issues uh, on the Crookston campus. So those uh, FY allocations recurring and non-recurring uh, total $18.9 million, which if you subtract that from 25, gives you the 6.1 that we're carrying forward uh, to uh, FY13. Uh, we are, of course, uh, are, of course, looking forward to uh, FY13 and constructing the preliminary budget uh, for that year. Uh, 8.3, again, uh, is the tuition relief that we will uh, we'll, we'll provide. Uh, we are carrying forward uh, the um, strategic, I'm sorry, we are um, setting aside $8.55 million for strategic investments in 13, uh, which would be recurring funds available to us in uh, 13 of 16.85. Uh, together with the non-recurring funds that we carry forward of 6.1. So that's a framework for us to construct uh, the FY13 budget. So uh, that, uh, Madam Chair, is a relatively brief summary. This was discussed in, in more detail in committee uh, yesterday, uh, and we have prepared a resolution uh, for you uh, if you choose to adopt this budget recommendation.
Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I will, I will now entertain a motion, and then we will have discussion, a motion uh, to accept the resolution. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. And now uh, it will be open for discussion and comment. Regent Frobenius. Um, just to note that our committee, uh, the Finance and Operations Committee yesterday did review this in some great degree of depth. Uh, we're not asked to take an action, but I'll tell you my personal opinion is that these are, are a well thought through and uh, appropriate uh, level of, of, of expenditures for this $25 million. Um, and the particular comfortable with the portion of this that's put into non-recurring allocations that give us some greater flexibility uh, going into fiscal year 13, both with some carryover from the first year and the other. I do want to note one part of this. Um, there's discussion in this, and we're putting a portion of this to restore some of the Merck funding for those things that we directly operate. Um, the university is at the heart of the medical education mission in this state, and uh, uh, we, we simply don't have the resources to deal with the other problem that exists with the Merck reductions which is but has some far larger cuts in the Merck budget to uh, cause some significant issue to residency training um, for physicians throughout the state of Minnesota. And we're trying to do our part to deal with that, which we directly operate, but uh, we were, we're unable to deal with the larger issue. Thank you, Regent Frobenius. Uh, Regent Sviggum. Madam Chair, in my second to the uh, resolution, I want to uh, compliment the President and his balance that he's brought forward his decision making. I think it's the appropriate decisions at the appropriate time. Times will change next year. And I certainly appreciate in the President's uh, message to us, his number one priority was tuition and the burden of tuition on, on families. Uh, just a couple of quick concerns about the budget, especially like the Merck and the vet lab, diagnostic lab funding. I think that is absolutely critical. Uh, the Merck funding, um, I'm somewhat concerned about uh, placing under non recurring funds, the, uh, the $4.1 million for the U Promise uh, scholarship uh, to U Promise students, the 13,000 students. I, I failed to understand how that can be non-recurring, and I think the pressure will be such that it will be, and we face that in the legislature as one-time spending that is going to come back and it's going to be permanent, and I think that probably will be the case. So, and, and also just to close, to while I support this, to get uh, Professor Kramer's attention. Um, I think it's incumbent upon us and we're compelled to look at efficiencies and inefficiencies uh, of costs in the future. Thank you. Uh, Regent Johnson and then Regent Broad. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, publicly, uh, I think it's appropriate to uh, thank the governor and the legislature for additional funds during very difficult uh, budgetary uh, constraints and budgetary times. Uh, second of all, I commend the President and his staff for these allocations. And thirdly, what strikes me is you didn't spend it all. You set aside a little money for a rainy day. We don't know what's to come down the, uh, down the road in the future economically or from appropriations from the state. So you have set aside uh, some money, give some, some flexibility for the future. So I commend you, Mr. President and Mr. Fitzenreiter, for, uh, for this uh, for this plan, so uh, thank you for uh, this document. Regent Broad. Uh, Madam Chair and uh, Mr. President, I, I appreciate and uh, commend you on your decisions and uh, what I view are clear priorities that you're taking um, in restoration of um, some tuition. I voted against the original budget uh, primarily based on the tuition jump that I saw. Um, my only lingering concern is actually very similar to Regent Swiggum in that um, the, part of the tuition jump that we saw for, for many students was because we used one-time stimulus funds to buy down tuition costs for students for one time. And so um, I hope that uh, we, we are considering that going forward. I think the fact that you uh, left some money on the bottom line uh, will help us with dealing with that one-time use of uh, funds for the Promise Scholarships. Um, and do appreciate the priority, I think, that was placed for tuition in 13. So, uh, Mr. President, I appreciate uh, your work on this. 
um, putting your, your stamp, I think, uh, very clearly in your priorities. Uh, budgets aren't numbers. They're expressions of priorities, and I think yours are in the right place on this one. Thank you. Regent Larson. Um, I would like to second um, what Regent Johnson just stated uh, in thanking the legislature and the governor for this uh, investment um, in higher education. I hope that this is a signal that in the future we are going to stop the disinvestment in higher education in this state. It is our most uh, important uh, investment that we make um, in this state and country, and it's critically important that we get our priorities right. So thank uh, second uh, Regent Johnson and thank the legislature and the, the governor once again and um, also encourage uh, further investment uh, in this great institution and also the Minsky system. Regent Beeson. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, 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 the guiding principle that all organizations, whether they're private or nonprofit or public, use in, in being uh, more successful tomorrow than they are today is, is balancing investments with cost reductions, even in the new normal, even in times of great economic pressure. Uh, outstanding organization invests in strength areas, and I'm pleased to see that we're making that effort. It's really hard to do that, um, um, but it's, it's important for the organization, and that we differentiate where we make our cuts and we make, where we make those investments, and, and, and that those differentiations are tied to that have strategic reasons behind them, and they're consistent with our strategic plan. I'm seeing evidence that we're doing that with this budget modification. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? If not, I will call the vote. All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. Aye. And any opposed? The resolution passes. And Vice President Fitzenreiter, thank you very much for all your help on, on this uh, budget amendment to appreciate it. I think you can stay right there because I believe you're on the next item. <laughs> um, Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, thank you uh, to the board for your support of this uh, resolution. And uh, also, I would uh, very much like to acknowledge the senior leadership at the university who worked very hard uh, to pull these numbers together for us. Right. Thank you. All right, we are moving from that amendment to the budget to the capital budget request. Um, and I will call on President Kaler and then Vice President O'Brien and Vice President Fitzenreiter. You've already come to the presenter's table, so we're all ready. President Kaler. Thank you, Madam Chair, and indeed we are well practiced at these presentations. Uh, I will uh, bring your attention to the state capital budget request, which is the next item in your, uh, your briefing book. Uh, these uh, reflect some, some uh, priorities for investment. Uh, the decisions are based on the intersection of academic needs, uh, infrastructure requests, and facilities uh, conditions. And I'm pleased to have Vice Presidents O'Brien and Fitzenreiter to make the report. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair, President Kaler, and board members. Uh, we have before you for review today the 2012 capital request. And uh, the capital process is driven first and foremost by the academic mission of the university. Our facilities exist to support teaching, research, and service. The project arrives primarily from the academic strategic plans compacts and from our facility condition assessment. What is before you today is an update of the preliminary requests that you received in July. After July meeting, the university's 2011 legislative capital request was acted on during the special session. Three projects were funded in that bonding bill, the Physics and Nanotechnology Building, the LRT Laboratory Mitigation Funding, and $25 million of HEPR targeted code required elevator improvements and uh, water correction projects. These projects were approved as capital budget amendments in the facilities committee yesterday and will be coming forward to you on this agenda uh, at your regular board meeting. 
As a result, the physics project was removed from the 2012 request and the amount of HEPR has been increased from 60 million to 90 million. I should also note that the administration has initiated a broader update of the six-year capital plan, which will be an important tool for us as we move forward. You should expect to see a review of the uh, new six-year capital plan at your February meeting, and we would ask you to act on it at your March meeting. This slide uh, illustrates the total request, and it is before you in prioritized order. I think it's important uh, when we say that it's before you in prioritized order to really recognize that this is the prioritized order of high priorities. In other words, this is the A-plus list of our needs. If we had, when we initiate our discussions in the six-year plan uh, and we talk to the, the deans and the academic vice presidents, we will note that there are significant needs on every campus and almost every college. And so when something gets into a request like this, it is already a priority. So it's very difficult for us to prioritize a list of the A-plus needs. That being said, uh, this list has been prioritized based on the uh, significance of the academic program, the uh, need of facilities improvement, and really the urgency to get some of these issues addressed. And it's really what gets them first on this list, but also gets them prioritized on this list. The specific information in detail with a little paragraph about each of these projects can be found on pages 111 and 112 in your docket. But I'll spend just a moment on each one. Uh, Regents uh, will recall that the Higher Education Asset Preservation and Replacement Funds are awarded to us from the state of Minnesota, but really with very specific guidelines for how they may be used. So that is for building system funds, utility infrastructure, uh, code and uh, regulation compliance. Uh, these projects are prioritized based on the facility condition assessment on each campus and they're allocated based on a formula that uh, calculates the amount of square footage in various components of the university and also on the facility needs assessment. As we sit here today, uh, the university actually has a little over a $200 million list of identified eligible HEPR projects. Uh, the $90 million list is what has been reprioritized in the last month by the various campuses uh, in coordination with each other. That list, uh, as we sit here today, will change before we're before you in October, and definitely will change before we're before the legislature. And that's due to the fact that events do change the priorities. So if we have a burst pipe, like we did last Saturday in the Mayo Building, or we have an ice storm or a wind storm, obviously these priorities will be continually adjusted. Vice President O'Brien, before you go on to the next item, I'm going to call on Regent Simmons. to our care clinic in case there's any real or perceived conflict of interest because of my employer. Okay, thank you, Regent Simmons. All right, please continue, Vice President O'Brien. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the ambulatory care clinic uh, facility is critical to the financial health of the university's medical school as clinical revenue is used to both recruit and retain qualified faculty, but also to fund a share of the research and education programs. As you know, this is a very complicated project. We have made significant progress in the last month on the building program, but we continue to do additional analysis on the overall financial arrangement, the project pro forma, and the defined benefits to the medical school. And we will be back at our next month's meeting with additional information about the ambulatory care clinic. Uh, the next project is the Old Main Utility Building Renovation. 
the university's facilities management department projects a sh shortage in firm boiler capacity relative to peak speed steam demand for the east and west banks of the Twin Cities campus beginning in 2015. Uh, we also expect that one of the boilers at the southeast steam plant will need to be retired sometime during or near 2015. This is a boiler that went online in 1949 and for if some of you are around my age it makes me a little sensitive to say it needs to be retired. <laughs> greatly magnifying our supply and demand issues. The ability to provide reliable and sufficient steam supply will be greatly impaired in the near future, putting university facilities, our teaching and research activities at substantial risk. This shortfall was anticipated in the utility master plan that the regents uh, saw in 2009, and various strategies for meeting the shortage were considered through that planning process. And that's what brings this particular proposal to us today that not only meets our uh, energy management objectives of cost control, reliability, and sustainability, but really indicates for us somewhere between a three to seven million dollar annual savings in our utility costs. The Itasca Facilities Improvement Project was on our capital uh, request in FY10 and FY11. In FY10 it actually uh, was recommended um, and approved by the legislature by, but vetoed by the governor. This is part of our historic statewide land grant mission. Itasca State Park is the second oldest state park in the nation. The research facility at Itasca State Park has just celebrated its 100th university. Uh, the biological station is unique in that it is a year-round facility serving undergraduate students, graduate students, and uh, for uh, centers for faculty research across several academic programs. This new campus center will provide a year-round and multi-purpose facility, and it really replaces some single function buildings that date from uh, the WPA area. And if you have not been up to the Itasca State Park facility, biological station, I would urge you to do so. Um, this program also will not only serve the academic needs of this very important program, but also uh, provide progress towards the goal of energy self-sufficiency at this field station through the use of solar, uh, passive solar energy. The next project is the Eddy Hall Renovation and Space Optimization Project. Uh, the uh, Facilities Committee has received updates on the university's space utilization efforts in December and May, and actually the board acted, acted on decommissioning a uh, number of buildings at your May meeting. Eddie Hall's renovation is part of this old, uh, overall effort. Eddie Hall is the oldest building on the Twin Cities campus. It's located at the corner of Pleasant and Pillsbury in the historic Knoll District. This project will completely renovate Eddie Hall to serve as a home for the admissions program for uh, transfer students and international students. The Freshman Welcome Center will remain in the renovated Jones Hall. The project will also improve utilization in approximately 100,000 square feet of office and academic support space in uh, the Downhow buildings and the West Bank office building. Uh, as a result, we will be decommissioning Fraser and Williamson Hall, which will save us $1.1 million annually in operating costs and avoid an estimated $35 million in our 10-year facility condition need or repair and replacement costs for those buildings. Then the last building is the American Indian Learning Resource Center. This is a request, again, a project that was in our FY10 and 11 requests, uh, funded by the legislature in the bonding bill of 10 but vetoed by the governor. It is a request to construct an American Indian Learning Resource Center at the University of Minnesota Duluth. 
17 programs that are currently scattered throughout the campus will be co-located in this new facility. American Indians compromise the largest minority population at UMD, and UMD's program is one of the largest American Indian programs in several academic disciplines um, across the country. The campus strong support system has resulted in graduation rates significantly higher than national norms for American Indian people. This new center will house both academic and student service programs, classrooms, a computer lab, conference rooms, a great room for large gatherings, and support offices for both faculty and students. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Vice President Fitzenreiter, to uh, discuss the financial summary. Madam Chair, members of the committee, this slide shows you on the, the total cost of these projects, 409 million one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars but does split it as you can see between the university share and the state share so what in essence we're doing here is asking the state of minnesota to fund two hundred and sixty nine point four million dollars of this request and the university share would be hundred and thirty nine point seven um, the clinic project the ambulatory care clinic is a big part of the request a uh, hundred million to the state of minnesota if you just set that project aside for a moment and you look at the nature of what we're asking for. About 4% of the remaining list is new projects and 96% relates to renewal activities on the campus. So again, the request um, is heavily focused on renewal and not new, but for the clinic project itself, which is and would be a new construction. Again, the university share would be 139.7 million and the state at 269.4 million. And this item is here for review. This is the resolution. It's here for review this month and we'll be back in October for approval. And thank that, you. Uh, we stand for questions. Okay, thank you, Vice President O'Brien and Vice President Fitz and Ryder. Uh, this, as Vice President Fritz and Ryder said, this is here for review this month and it will be for action at our October meeting. And so now uh, it's open for discussion to the board. Regent Allen. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to mention that I thought uh, the discussion we had in some of the presentations at the facilities uh, committee really dealt in depth. Uh, with many of the issues we have in, in that area. It was one of the best presentations I think we have. I just wanted to comment uh, quickly on the HEPA request. Uh, you know, it's easy for a legislature or somebody else to look at fancy new buildings and say, boy, we understand that and it's a great achievement. It's a lot harder to put money into maintenance and repair. Uh, based on the figures we looked at yesterday, if we were to get this $90 million we asked for and add to it some of the dollars we spend completely doing buildings or taking down buildings, we end up getting around to all our buildings about every 20 years. And that, that's better than we've talked about in the past because we have increased the amounts for HEPRA. We've increased the amount going into renovation, so that's an improvement. But uh, it kind of puts it into perspective. Uh, uh, if we get half of that amount that's asked for, which has been a tendency of the legislature. Someone asked about correlations between what we asked for yesterday and what we get. Runs about 50%, I think, on the average. That increases that uh, cycle to about 30 years. So that's what these dollars mean in those terms. Thank you, Regent Allen. Other comments or questions? All right, Regent Frobenius and then Regent Sfigum. Thank you, Chair Cohen. I want to speak about the uh, ambulatory care clinic, and I want to direct the uh, board's attention to, I guess, the third and fourth sentences of that brief presentation. The current clinics were designed in the 1960s for a patient capacity of 150,000 annual visits. Today, these same facilities handle 750,000 annual visits five times the volume they were designed to accommodate. This is particularly intriguing to me, and this sort of shows my age, but uh, in the late 60s, I was getting a graduate degree in healthcare administration at the University of Minnesota, and walked by these lovely new clinics that we had, 
uh, watching the Vietnam War protests that were going on on campus and a variety of other activities that actually came in late years later than, than the time these clinics were built. We haven't built really any healthcare facilities on this side of the river since 1985. And these were, were 20 years prior to that. So we're, we're, we're out of date. And we are significantly out of date as those numbers pull out. Now I want to make a couple of points. Uh, Mail plays a, a major role in the state production of physicians as well, but we have the largest part of that responsibility in this state. And if we mess it up, uh, this state's going to be short a su adequate supply of physicians. Uh, I recently went to my old healthcare organization, the St. Cloud Hospital, and uh, took a look, and almost a third of the uh, St. Cloud Hospital's medical staff did their undergraduate medical education at the University of Minnesota. And so, just to give you that example of, of one place, and I'm sure that story plays out all across the state. A successful and highly rated medical school requires a successful clinical practice of the faculty to attract and retain qualified faculty to support the educational mission of the university. There is no other way to get this thing done. And if we don't continue, if we don't take care of our facility problem, which is a long nagging problem here, um, the, uh, we're going to not be able to fulfill that mission and attract and retain highly qualified faculty. Uh, I have been told recently that the state, Minnesota State Hospital Association said as one of its top priorities for the coming year, increasing Minnesota's supply of providers with emphasis on primary care providers. The industry that provides these services is, is crying for the state and for Minnesota and the University of Minnesota to continue to expand its mission. We have to do this to accomplish that task. This is a difficult project to accomplish. It's a difficult pro project to finance. Um, and to fulfill the educational mission is going to require some state assistance in this process. And so uh, I, I'm extremely pleased to see this uh, project here. It is long overdue. It is an extremely important role to a unique mission that we solely provide, not solely, but we provide the major source of in the state, that is the supply of physicians in the state, and uh, encourage that we continue to pursue this aggressively. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Frobenius. Uh, Regent Swiggum. Um, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, and Regent Allen, you're correct. Uh, bonding legislators love shovels at groundbreaking, and they love scissors at ribbon cuts. They, they get pictures. Um, I was just wondering if, oh, thank you. Yeah, I don't know that anyone wants to hear me, Ann, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we do. We do, we do. Okay. Well, I'm just echoing what uh, Regent Allen said about uh, bonding project stuff. Thinking out loud, I'm just wondering, if it's if we couldn't be a little more strategic in, in our request. Uh, recognizing, uh, Chairman Allen says we get about half of our requests usually from the legislature. I think a rule of thumb is higher education will give up one-third of the bonding bill, approximately, and that'll be split between Minsku and that'll be and the university fairly, fairly evenly. Um, Fitz, as, as we look at this uh, presentation, and uh, as Vice President O'Brien uh, gave us the uh, numbers on the uh, old main facility, which I think is necessary, I think we need to do. But I'm, I'm thinking like this, and tell me why I'm wrong. Um, the old main facility, one of the reasons we're going to do that energy project is it's going to uh, save us approximately about $7 million a year. It's going to reduce our costs about $7 million a year. That's given we get two-thirds of the funding from the state. But even if we don't get two-thirds of the funding from the state, my understanding is we're still going to reduce our costs by 3 to $4 million a year. Is that correct? Two, two to three. Uh, two to three. Well, it was three to four over the phone call we had, but uh, it's been reduced a little bit now. Um, but it, even even given that, if it's going to reduce our costs, we are going to save money. Would it at all be possible or within the realm that we do that project by ourselves, just with university funds? We're going to save money. We're going to save that two to three million now, uh, and and. and then by we leave the request from the legislature strategic, strategically, either place more money into HEPR, as Regent Allen would like to do, which I think is necessary, or get a better chance of getting funded our fourth and fifth A-plus priorities. 
Um, is that at all a strategic thing to think about? Uh, since the project is going to save us money, it's going to reduce our costs, why wouldn't we fund it ourselves, whether the legislature is there or not? Vice President Fitzenreiter. Madam Chair, uh, Regent Swingham, um, there's the issue of debt capacity. Um, it's worth 2.6 percent yesterday. The figure well, the, yes, the overall amount of debt outstanding that we'd have, it would add to the operating cost burden because we wouldn't have the two-thirds share from the state, so that two-thirds is clearly saving us on uh, funds that we would have to find in the institutional budget to pay the debt service on 81 million instead of the debt service on the uh, one-third share that we would have um, if the legislature adopted the uh, uh, project. So we save that, that amount of money, um, which is important to the university's overall budget, puts less burden on tuition, puts less burden on operating budgets of academic and support units. Um, Madam Chair, yes, I accept can... that, but if, if I'm correct, and, and maybe I'm not looking at this correctly, but uh, uh, when we uh, are going to reduce our costs by that two to three million dollars a year, or the seven with the state support, um, and that was given debt service, maintenance, operation, everything included, we were still going to save seven million dollars a year of reduced costs. I, I understand we'd have to increase our debt service amount, but we're we're still going to reduce costs by two to three million dollars a year. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, you got to realize that the 27 million share that the university has on this project, the one third, that will cost the institution about two and a half million dollars in debt service a year. So what we're really talking about is then we've got to make up the other 54 million from the state because they're not paying for that. The university would be paying for that. And that's the money I'm talking about, that we then have to find that funds out of the operating budget of the institution. Yeah, it's going to take a conversation with Fitz privately, I yes. think. But, but still, I was told, at least my understanding over the phone was, that uh, c even debt service considered, and, and I realize that it's nice to use somebody else's money rather than our own, but debt service, operation, maintenance, everything considered, we're still going to reduce our costs. And, and I thought that made up for the debt service uh, increased cost to us, that debt service was included in that savings. Yeah. Madam Chair, members, we can yes. have this conversation with you and follow up for sure. Okay. At least you see where I... Oh, absolutely. Going. Absolutely, Regent Swigan. Okay. Regent Ramirez and then Regent Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair. When the bonding bill goes through, I think we're going to hear a lot of conversation about creating jobs and about shovel ready projects that are going to go out, out when we get to that point. I'm not talking about right now, but when we get to that point, can you just comment on where these projects are and how we can answer those questions? Madam, Madam Chair, Regent uh, Ramirez and uh, Regents, Mr. President. Uh, there are projects on this list that indeed are shovel ready. Um, the Itasca facility, the American Indian Center that have been under development for some time will be in that category. Uh, with regard to Eddie Hall, we are just at the point of initiating design on that project. Uh, so those would be the projects that would be the most shovel ready in terms of actually in the next year initiating uh, construction, uh, really initiating construction and having folks at work. The old main utility building renovation is a much longer term project. There are people who would be put to work. And I guess this is maybe an important point to make. Uh, shovel ready isn't the only jobs that are put to work when you have uh, construction projects. And there's been a tremendous downturn in architecture and engineering jobs in the state of Minnesota. So the old main project and the ambulatory care clinic projects that are much more complex will have people at work on them now in terms of design and engineering, but would have even more work by folks uh, designing the boilers, uh, designing the clinic facilities, determining what equipment is needed. 
So those are a little farther out in terms of the construction, probably a year and a half or two years in terms of actually the construction industry, but a lot of other jobs in the short term on design and engineering. Thank you. Regent Allen. I think it's a good conversation that uh, Regent Sviggum has started on, on this issue, but I just want to bring in uh, one item that has to be considered also. It's not just a matter of what we may save on a given project and therefore have the annual debt service available to finance it ourselves, but there's always the question of how much total debt do we have on our balance sheet, which the rating agencies look at. And a part of that is also that we've always tried to keep some reserve capacity there uh, for things that were unforeseen, uh, either disasters of some kind or opportunities that we couldn't forego. And uh, you know, one thing that might even kind of fit a little bit in that category, uh, not necessarily a, it's not a disaster, but it's a, uh, an item that's a very big one, is the one that uh, Regent Fabinia spoke to, the Ambulatory Care Center. So we need to look at both the balance sheet itself and the debt service versus the savings. But it's a good conversation you started, but it needs to have that aspect looked at also. Regent Beeson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would agree with uh, Regent Allen. Neither the Ambulatory Care Center nor the the uh, old main utility were on our original six-year plan. and those opportunities or problems do arise and we do need some capacity to, to deal with them. Um, on the old main utility um, project specifically, I've talked to Vice President O'Brien about this and although I wasn't in the, the facilities committee, one of the things that she's outlined is whether on that project we should sell and lease back or whether we should own um, and then whether we should operate it ourselves or whether we should send it out to the private sector. And a concept that I have that maybe the facilities committee could look at is the idea of, first of all, I'm in favor of us owning that plant. I don't think we should sell those assets and lease them back. But in terms of the maintenance and operation, the concept that I've seen other government units use is we actually bid for the serv our own service. We bid against the private sector. This And this is a case where we may have core competency to run the plant and be able to do it cheaper than the private sector. But we don't know that unless we're actually competing um, uh, against them uh, for those services. So whether it's this plant or whether it's building maintenance, I think the, I, the idea that I'd like somebody to look at would be um, um, having us package our costs in and, and bid um, against the private sector on these sort of non-academic um, projects. Madam Chair. Yes, Vice President uh, O'Brien. Madam Chair, uh, Mr. President, Regent Vicent and uh, Board. The Actually, the Twin Cities campus steam plant is currently run by Foster Wheeler on a contract basis, not dissimilar to what Regent Beeson is describing. 20 years ago, the university did an RFP for design and construction and operations and maintenance of the Southeast Steam Plant and as a result of that, we operate with a contract with Foster Wheeler. This project will call the question on if we should continue the uh, contract with Foster Wheeler or how we should move forward. And so the analysis that he's suggesting is underway and will be back to the board, but it's really premature until we have the project funded and moving forward. Thank you. Uh, Regent Frobenius. Thank you, Chair. Um, Cohen, one of the things that just has to be part of any of these discussions of a utility plant is the, a little re recollection that this is the Achilles heel of every major complex organization. It kind of gets the bottom of the discussion all the time until it, something really blows up and then all of a sudden it's been the major, major crisis. And, and that sort of un underlines this because there is an element of replacement costs in this, in this project. I have a simple request. Whatever discussion and analysis occurs between uh, Regent Sviggum and, and, and Vice President Fitzenreuter, I'd be interested in seeing that analysis, which, would, which I assume will ultimately include sort of the cost savings estimate comparison um, versus various debt service proposals. But what I'm most interested in that is, is the inflationary assumptions that you put into a cost savings projection on, on energy, because that's a difficult number to accurately predict 
as to which, which what, what. And so far, historically, we've always under under projected inflation costs with, around energy. So anyway, I, I just would ask that that whatever analysis occurs in that discussion be shared. Okay, and we'll share it with the whole board. Uh, Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Cohen. Um, I'm. I'm interested in supporting the overall request. I think it's well prioritized. I think it's well thought out. Three specific pieces of it arouse a lot of passion in me, and uh, most importantly, and I, I can't say better than Regent Provenius already has, the importance and criticality of the ambulatory care piece. I just don't think we can ever meet our mission here without uh, getting moving on that, and the clinical care piece of that is just fundamental to everything we do. My background and everything would suggest that I'm passionate about utility plant discussions, so I have spent a considerable amount of time with, uh, with the, the team here, and I think that from a strategic perspective, it's well thought out and that we're exiting some solid fuel coal boilers that are, you know, 60 plus years old and are going to have huge environmental compliance issues going forward and really doubling down on the, uh, a very, very good solid fuel technology with the, com with the uh, circulating fluidized bed boiler that's there. They're going to keep that, and that may very well and should continue on a coal-fired basis, but it's an excellent technology. And then the rest of the capacity going forward for steam is, uh, is natural gas, which is much easier to operate, less uh, maintenance-intensive, and uh, certainly much more environmentally uh, friendly than those old coal stoker boilers that are there. So I think that the team's done a good job of thinking this one through, and they're building steam capacity for the future, and uh, that's what we need to do. And I tend to agree with uh, Regent Beeson as well that there may be some different ways to look at how we ultimately cost it out, but this is one where I think we do have a lot of internal expertise, a lot of core competency, and we need to do that. And the last of those things that arouses some passion in me from a personal standpoint is the need for the Learning Resource Center up at UMD. That is a, they have, they have a world-class level of depth in American Indian knowledge studies, a student base that is second to none in the country, and uh, it really is fragmented up there. So that one makes a lot of sense too. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, and I think we'll uh, have one more comment and then move on to the next agenda item. So Regent Broad. I wanted to highlight something I think that Regent Beeson said as an aside, but I, I think it deserves to be highlighted. And, and what you mentioned was that the ambulatory care clinic and the utility were not even on the plan six years ago. And that is, is significant to me. And it's significant to me because it shows a, a strategic analysis and, a re, and an a ability and willingness to reshuffle priorities as they come forward. So it's not just about checking boxes off on a list or checking buildings off on a list. And as I evaluate everything that comes forward, that to me is significant uh, in terms of the management uh, assessment uh, coming forward from this team. So I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you very much for this very good discussion, Regents, and Vice President O'Brien and Vice President Fitzenreiter for all your work that you've done on this. And it will be back again in October. The next item, uh, Provost Sullivan, please come to the presenter's table, and we will talk about the university plan, performance, and accountability report, and with an introduction uh, from President Kaler. Thank you, Chair Cohen. Uh, this is the 10th edition of the university plan, performance, and accountability uh, report. Uh, I have found it uh, incredibly useful to me as I uh, acquaint myself more deeply with the university. I, I believe our team has put together a, a very valuable resource, and I uh, turn the microphone to uh, Provost Sullivan for a presentation. Good morning, Chair Cohen, uh, President Kaler, members of the board. Uh, this is my uh, eighth opportunity to present the annual accountability report to you, as the president said. Uh, uh, this began in uh, the 2000. I'd like to introduce my colleague, Joe Schultz. Uh, many of you know him. Um, he is uh, in the provost office and responsible for gathering and monitoring the data for us and, and arraying it uh, in the format that you have before you today. Um, this is here for your review and discussion uh, with action um, next month, and so we can take your questions and comments in between and after the presentation and uh, amplify uh, anything that may be uh, of concern uh, before it becomes final for your consideration uh, next month. This report today is focusing, as does the uh, written report before you, on really quality uh, output measures, productivity, and impact. 
uh, at, as it has evolved over the last um, 10 years, we have moved to looking and analyzing and commenting more on output measures, productivity, and impact, whereas in earlier versions, input measures were, were the focus. Um, as you can see from the report itself, um, it is broken down into several categories, education, research, outreach and public engagement, focus on our world-class faculty and staff, and on the infrastructure and our organization to support our education, research, and public engagement uh, mission. I think the report, as you can see, is rich in detail. Um, and um, so as not to be redundant from yesterday's presentation before many, if not most, of our committees, I thought this year I would change the presentation a bit. And uh, I want to share with you uh, a review, first with regard to the Twin Cities campus, and then I will move to the coordinate campus review. But you have a handout in front of you, which I, I hope arrays the data that goes directly to the question of output, measures, productivity, and impact. And as you can see uh, at, at the top of that sheet that we've handed out that summarizes the educational part of this report, um, as the President noted earlier in his remarks, the university had almost 40,000 applications uh, this year. Uh, when we um, started strategic planning at the university in 2004, the applications were 18,000. And 10 years ago, when the reporting began uh, for this exercise, we were at 15,000 uh, applications. You can see with regard to um, um, our first year class uh, and the admissions uh, data um, that uh, we are making significant progress regarding the academic profile and the preparation of our classes from the benchmark of 2004 to the present. 43% uh, now of our students come from the top 10% of their classes. And I will also share with you today some projections of the new class that just arrived uh, this week. And as you know, we will finalize those in 10 days, and I'll come back in the October meeting and give you the final numbers. But we're projecting that that number percentage will go to 45% uh, uh, for the Twin Cities uh, uh, campus. Uh, with regard to the top 25, again, you can see the progress there, and we will be projecting that that percentage of 83% will go uh, closer to 84% for the uh, class that just arrived. Uh, the average high school rank has also gone up significantly and will in this class at around 85.5%. The standardized test that we use, the national test, has gone up remarkably uh, in this period of time. And again, in the new class, we're projecting it will be over that 27.2% that you have in front of you. Our students of color uh, measures uh, show that we have been right around 18 to 20% over the uh, period of time that we've been measuring. And we are predicting that that number will go uh, higher again for the new class at 18.5% students of color. The President, in his earlier remarks, mentioned National Merit Scholars. In 2004, we had 51 National Merit Scholars in the first year class, and we are projecting for the class that arrived this week 167 National Merit Scholars, which will put us first in the Big Ten by some distance. Um, our entering students um, has stayed relatively the same. And we're projecting for the new class 5,378, so a bit up from the number you have in front of you of fall of 2010. Um, and uh, finally, in this column, uh, we've reported earlier, but it continues to hold steadily, the historic uh, record of retention from the first year to the second year. The last two years have now averaged over 90% retention from freshman year to the second year. We often uh, 
talk about as a critical element of the university, uh, tuition, financial aid. Uh, the next chart shows you the substantial progress that we have made in undergraduate financial aid. Total aid from 2004 through 2010 went from $73 million to $137 million. And if you look at the total student aid, we've gone from $214 million to $322 million through the academic year 2010. This board has focused uh, much attention, appropriately so, on the university's graduation rates. We had much distance to go, and this report shows you the significant progress on the four-year graduation rate. Uh, we are now at 50 percent. We reached that this past year, another historic mark, and you can see great progress in the five- and six-year rates um, as, as well. Um, I think it's very interesting and important to note with regard to the demand for jobs and highly educated and skilled jobs in Minnesota that the university uh, from 2004 through the present has increased uh, uh, by um, almost 900 degrees uh, awarded from the bachelor's standpoint from the university. That's a direct uh, effect on the uh, jobs. Uh, and the quality of jobs here in Minnesota. This board, when we began strategic planning, set out a goal to increase substantially the international student enrollment uh, in our undergraduate cohort. And you can see that we have met the target that we set out for at 6% undergraduates from international and, and uh, foreign students. Um, <clears throat> With regard to research, uh, undergraduate research, and the President noted this earlier as a supplemental investment in his proposed budget, uh, we have now on average some 660 students in a given year times four across the four-year undergraduate experience, uh, having an opportunity to work with senior major faculty in significant research projects. This is a very important program because one of our distinctivenesses at this university is our ability to have first-rate classroom instruction together with the student's ability to work with senior faculty in the research area. This is one of the university's most distinctive recruitment um, opportunities. You continue to see uh, in the next columns uh, our graduate and professional education and how we have uh, uh, been increasing uh, the um, uh, master's degrees. Uh, I want to note here uh, that very substantial increase from 2004 to 2010, and we would expect that number to go up rather significantly. As you remember, two board meetings ago, we reported on the blue ribbon reports coming from all of our collegiate units. And on virtually every one of those reports, we saw the faculty making recommendations to increase terminal and professional master's degrees, largely because of the new increased dynamic demand in the marketplace. And so I think uh, we are about looking at how we can produce those new terminal and professional master's degree for workforce needs in the state and beyond. And so we can project that that 2009-10 number of 3,400 will probably increase substantially. With regard to doctoral degrees, you can also see uh, the increase there. Uh, we are undergoing right now in our graduate programs, as you know, we discussed this in our Blue Ribbon recommendations two months ago, um, a, a relook at our size and the quality of our graduate programs. And I think we can project perhaps fewer doctoral programs uh, at, at the PhD level. Um, uh, and fewer graduate students in the PhD program. So we can ensure quality and that we can ensure that our graduates from the PhD program are coming out of absolutely first-rate programs. Uh, professional degrees in our professional schools continue to do exceedingly well on the demand side of the market, and you see an increase there uh, on the Twin Cities campus of uh, the, uh, the increased numbers um, uh, as well. 
with regard to um, overall student enrollment, and we've been watching this for over 10 years, but you have the numbers arrayed here from 2004 to the present. Um, um, the non-degree granting students cohort has actually gone down significantly, and the reason for this, I believe, is because we've been trying to concentrate our resources and the investment on degree granting students, which is our core priority um, at the university. Uh, the undergraduate enrollment, you can see, uh, has gone up uh, on the Twin Cities campus. And in fact, we're, we're projecting in the new class that arrived this week, 30,547 students. So a slight increase of some 30 students undergraduate this year over last year. Um, I mentioned the graduate students just a moment ago. That cohort has gone up, but we are projecting this year in the new class that actually that will be down seven or 800 students per our strategic planning process. Um, the professional students um, have gone up significantly, and we're projecting this year that to hold very, very much the same in the new class. So total students at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus uh, through 2010 was 51,721, and we are projecting as we sit here this morning that that number will be at 50,824 when we make our final count here in uh, uh, the next week. Uh, the next column shows you how well we're doing with regard to faculty on the Twin Cities campus. 32% of our tenure track uh, faculty are women, and 17% of our tenure tenure track faculty are faculty of color. Um, and uh, our number of tenure tenure track faculty from 2004 to, to 10 um, has gone up, but in the last two budget years, that number actually has gone down a net 53 faculty. And that's one of the reasons why the president uh, a few minutes ago is uh, recommending to the board increased investments in faculty hiring to make sure that we do not lose an advantage on our student faculty ratios in the delivery of the educational mission, as well as our ability to continue to be first rate in research. The next column goes to that question of research. Uh, and you've heard this before. We have an annual report in December on this for you. $823 million in external funding, um, and that has brought the university within the top 10 public and private universities in the United States in the top eight of public research uh, universities. And importantly, for the core central part of our university, our library uh, has continued its momentum of excellence and its national and international recognition for uh, significance in all respects, and you can see the, the great uh, ranking there, and that's particularly important in light of the budget cuts at the university in the last two years. Our library continues to soar in its national and international uh, reputation, and this one particularly is based upon expenditures, which I thought was the most relevant for you to see. Um, and I would add as a footnote, during the budget cuts, we took not one dollar of cuts in the collection budget of our university because of its centrality to the overall mission of the university. Um, with that report with regard to the Twin Cities uh, campus, I would like to next turn to um, important um, uh, examination uh, of our coordinate campuses. Um, and then I would like to finish with a summary of some points in the larger report that sometimes don't get emphasized, but I think are very interesting and important. So I will finish with that uh, after I look and share with you a review of the um, coordinate campuses. First, with regard to Duluth, um, you have a slide here. Um, the Duluth campus uh, has undergone a year-long exciting new strategic planning process that is beginning to really focus and clarify its mission and identify the campus's vision, core values, and goals. And this is a new strategic plan uh, directed and led by our new uh, uh, chancellor on the Duluth campus. Duluth has increased enrollment um, uh, and the number of degrees awarded. Nearly 2,000 more students uh, and 
uh, of that, 1,500 undergraduates, students enrolled in Duluth over the last 10 years. 400 more degrees coming out of our Duluth campus than over 10 years ago. Um, and Duluth continues to make progress with regard to students of color and students from underrepresented groups. Their first year class is at 8%. Um, Duluth has also uh, revised, in a very exciting way, I think, their new liberal education requirements. And it's about enhancing and focusing greater attention at Duluth on the value of a liberal education on the Duluth campus. Duluth continues to improve on its retention, uh, on its academic preparation as we look at their uh, ACT scores. Uh, they continue to make progress on their graduation rates. Uh, and importantly, the Duluth campus begins to expand uh, its graduate programs. They now have 25 graduate programs. They have just begun some exciting new ones, a master's degree in tribal administration and governance a master's degree in civil engineering because of the demand, particularly for northern Minnesota. Uh, as you know, in 2007, they opened up an exciting new program for a doctorate in education. And in the last two years, after very careful multi-year planning, they have begun a master's and PhD program, the first PhD program on the Duluth campus in interdisciplinary biology that shows great promise. Um, I think it's fair to say that the Duluth campus also is in the forefront of increased investments and sensitivity to their world-class freshwater research that takes place uh, on that campus. With regard to the Morris campus, uh, Morris, as we know and we like to champion, is a national leader in renewable energy and sustainability, and as you can see on the slide there, they are integrating and leveraging um, that expertise right into their classroom so that they're bringing it to and sharing it with their students in the educational mission um, as well. Um, Morris continues to attract an increasingly diverse and talented student body while maintaining their selectivity. Students from the top 10% of the high school class at Morris are up nearly five points since 2007. Their ACT scores continue to go up. 35% of the students in the first year class are first generation college students on the Morris campus. And 27% of their, of their first year class, 27% of their first year class are students of color. Remarkable progress. And of course we know on the Morris campus a very large component, a very important component of the undergraduate enrollment, 12% are uh, American Indian, Native American students. Morris is also working continuously on their comparative peer group, um, which it will be an important benchmark for us to be able to look at when that is completed, uh, because so much of our metrics and measures look at, as you know, peer and comparative groups. Enrollment at Morris has bounced back up, which is very positive. Their international student enrollment has jumped to 5.5%, and for Morris, this is a, a significant improvement, and we're pleased with that. Um, and uh, while the retention rates have bounced around just a bit, um, uh, importantly, their graduation rates at 50% are holding steady for four-year graduation. Um, and, and I think quite remarkably, when you look at student satisfaction, a real output measure that's important, Morris is one of the ones that really leads in high student satisfaction with the academic program. Turning to Crookston, Crookston has become very importantly in our university system one of the leaders on online delivery of uh, distance education. Ten of the campus's now 29 baccalaureate programs are entirely online. Um, and uh, Crookston can be very uh, richly proud for this leadership and, uh, and the uh, creativity and innovation uh, on their online uh, educational programs. This has actually grown 30% in 2008. Uh, Crookston continues to uh, work well with relationships in the business and local community uh, in the Northwest, North 
West Research and Outreach Center, our own extension, the regional uh, sustainability development partnerships and the area health uh, centers, all very important part of integrating into the Crookston campus and the, and the rich community there. It turns out that Crookston is doing a lot with a very small, relatively small budget and a faculty of only about 49. So when you look at the number of and the productivity of the faculty, this may go to Professor Kramer's earlier point, uh, Crookston is performing exceedingly well. Um, and uh, another no mention, 6.5% uh, of its student body are international students in Crookston. Um, and of course they too have many, many students who are first generation college students. They continue to work on uh, and see challenges, but continue to work on their graduation rates, and we're pleased with that attention given to that by Chancellor Casey. Um, undergraduate enrollment at Crookston is up over 300 students in the last year, and I would like to compliment Chancellor Casey for his very close attention to these enrollment numbers, up 300 students in an area that's seen some significant recession in the last several years. Finally, with regard to Rochester, our newest campus, uh, Rochester is providing a, a really a, a very interesting programmatic niche in the health and biosciences field, and they are doing remarkable uh, progress with regard to leveraging the intellectual and the economic resources in the southeast part of uh, Minnesota working closely with the Mayo Clinic, with IBM, with our Twin Cities campus, um, and with, of course, the Hormel Institute. Uh, they are developing very interesting, creative innovations in uh, these different cohort models of learning, particularly connecting to one of our priorities on this campus, the biomedical informatics, uh, computational biology, uh, Rochester and its leadership is connecting very well with our, our colleagues here on the Twin Cities campus as they build the Bachelor of Science degree in Health Science and the Bachelor of Science degree in the Health Professions. Uh, as, as you know, they're partnering and have had great successes with the City of Rochester, with the Mayo Clinic, and in expanding, and uh, we'll get more preview of this later with regard to their master plan. Um, and importantly, the city is stepping forward with investments of city sales tax, which is a very unique and important partnership for our Rochester campus. Um, Rochester is still a very small campus. It has but 143 students in the new core, 10 faculty, dynamic leadership with their chancellor and vice chancellor. They're off to a very solid, promising start. Uh, and even the diversity of their students now is, is exceeding 15% in this new uh, group of students. They've expanded into five buildings. I know they have plans for more. We'll hear more about that later. But I think um, uh, I'd like to conclude uh, a remark about Rochester to show you how it is soaring um, in competence um, and productivity, uh, and it's being noticed. Uh, because there is a new national uh, feature going to be uh, aired on national public radio uh, where several of the leading universities in the United States are going to be featured about creativity and innovation in the classroom and teaching. Um, and you will be able to see on October 4th on Minnesota Public Radio this feature called Don't Lecture Me. And in that feature you will see Rochester and Harvard discussed as places to be for new innovations in the classroom. With that, I will conclude my remarks and uh, be willing and happy to take any comments or questions. Thank you very much, Provost Sullivan. And now we'll open to comments and discussion. Regent Simmons. To discuss in this rich report, and some of it will provide, I think, a, a terrific foundation for us as we take on issues in the coming year. But I did want to ask a specific question about the dramatic and r wonderful statistic on the National Merit Scholars uh, coming to the University of Minnesota. 
Can you give us a little idea of how that was achieved? Were there uh, specific and intentional investments to make that uh, occur? Chair Cohen and Region Simmons, members of the board, uh, it, was, it was very strategic. Um, and there is a cost associated with it as well, of course, when we recruit such talent. Um, uh, we understand um, that we, as a university, serve first and foremost the citizens of Minnesota. And we want to be able to recruit and retain the very best talent there is. Of the 167 students projected that are now walking on our campus this week in this first year class of National Merit Scholars, over half of those students are Minnesota students. And 35%, and an additional 35 of those students, in an additional 35 of those students are from Wisconsin. This is an opportunity for us to keep our very best in the state so that they can become leaders and, of course, enrich our job force, job uh, opportunities. And from time to time to import the very best from other states, uh, as in the case of Wisconsin uh, with that number. We decided that we had an opportunity with the university's growing reputation to be able to aggressively recruit National Merit Scholars, keep Minnesota's best import the very best we could so that hopefully if we deliver on our promise of a rich total student experience, these students will stay in Minnesota. It was strategic. It does have a cost because we support these students with scholarship and it's a, a cost that we uh, will need to continue to invest in. May I comment? I think this is so important um, to do. And when we have other opportunities to do similar things, we should. I would support that investment. This serves our state very well um, because it does retain, it does attract, and these are future leaders. These students graduate uh, at a substantially higher percent, I would imagine, than, than the general student body would. So these are students being accepted to a very good outcome and a very good outcome for our state. So thank you for that investment uh, and that strategy and I'd love to see more of that. Mm. Regent Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Provost Sullivan, your staff for the report, uh, both to the committees yesterday and, and today. Uh, the idea and uh, notion of recruiting, uh, let me explain. Uh, I know a family, they have a daughter that's a very, very good student, I believe in ninth grade or tenth grade, now receiving communication from a number of universities and <coughs> colleges and, and uh, attempt to recruit her to attend. Is that something the University of Minnesota would do, uh, finding good high school students, GPAs, and, and uh, start tracking uh, them? Reminds me of this notion, and, um, and it's a, kind of a fun notion. Some of you recall the famous football coach Bear Bryant, Alabama, national champions, and Regent Larson, you'd appreciate this. Uh, Bear Bryant uh, developed a relationship with all the hospitals in Alabama, and he wanted to know every male that was born who was over eight pounds. <laughs> And thus, he sent a congratulatory letter and, interestingly enough, a birthday card for the next 18 years, and thus some of the tradition of Alabama football. So I'm getting at uh, this idea of recruiting. Do the, does the University of Minnesota, are we that kind of creative in seeking good students, not to mention football players? Chair Cohen and <laughs> Regent Johnson, members of the board, we have a very seasoned, mature, experienced staff in the um, Office of Admissions. Uh, Wayne Ziegler, many of you know, has been with us a very long time. He's one of the most senior, talented people out there in college recruitment. Uh, Wayne and his team are very aggressive about recruiting. I, I don't believe that's one of the metrics we use, however, eight pounds or above. Um, although, uh, although Coach Kill may want to talk with us about that too, um, we are 
first and foremost recruiting Minnesota students. This is the University of Minnesota, and as the President said earlier in his remarks, our first priority are to the families of Minnesota and to the, and to the uh, students of Minnesota. And as he noted in his earlier remarks, 64 to 65 percent on a regular ongoing basis of our freshman class um, are Minnesota students. They have a preference in that regard. But when you look at the transfer students, um, so at the time of graduation, when you look at the whole cohort, it turns out that 75% of our undergraduate students are actually Minnesota students. Almost 30 to 35% at the time through graduation actually are transfer students, a very, very important part of the admissions process. We frequently focus on the undergraduate transfer piece and our artic articulation agreements and transfer credit agreements with Minskew and other institutions, very, very important part. Uh, we have an incredibly talented admissions office and, and we go after, uh, in the early grades, in the middle grades, Wayne and his team start recruiting and holding on campus. Um, on-campus sessions with them. I'm reminded um, several years ago I was on an airplane coming back to the Twin Cities from a trip and I had an individual sitting next to me, a, a young man I think in his 30s, and he asked me what I did. I said I worked at the university. Uh, he was a business person in town and he said, you know, I have an eight-year-old son. My wife and I did not go to the university, but my son loves hockey. And every Saturday he comes over to the university with his hockey outfit and his gear and he loves going in Mariucci for the practice camps. He said, the best advice I could give you is get those kids on your campus as soon as they're out of diapers. He said, they will grow up loving the U. Wayne Ziegler believes that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Regent Hung. Provost Sullivan for this report. I look forward to it every year so that I can see how we've improved year to year. My question is on global education. I think that that's such an important aspect of learning and as the world becomes smaller and smaller, it's important that our undergraduate students are studying. And I remember <coughs> last year reading a, either a report or maybe it was from here that um, the number of students that study abroad in America are a lot smaller than the students that study from other countries going into the countries around the world. And I think that that's a really important fact to know and I think that it's important that we do our part in making sure that students have a stu study abroad experience while they're in undergrad. So my question to you is, I know here in the report you show us that um, of the fall, in, in the fall 2,347 students are studying abroad and I'm wondering, can you give me a rough percentage of how many students, a percentage, uh, how many, what percentage of our undergraduate students end up studying abroad and then what our goal is for the percentage? Chair Cohen, um, Regent Hung, yes, this goal, uh, this board a number of years ago when we began uh, strategic planning, we had a conversation, I think it was six years ago, and the board said to me, we would like to see if at least 50% of our students could have that rich international experience. Uh, we are doing, um, at the present time, 40%, so we're marching right towards your goal uh, of 50%. We actually lead, I believe, the uh, CIC, our, our comparative group, including the University of Chicago, in the number of our students who study abroad. Uh, very important statistic. I think our report also shows um, that while we now have 6% in our, in our undergraduate enrollment, we are fourth among our peer institutions in that cohort of international students. So we made a lot of progress since strategic planning began. Um, as you all know, in our graduate programs, particularly in our PhD programs, we have a very substantial number of international students. I think that's about 25% of our PhD students, our international students. So the campus on the ground has become a very internationalized student body. <clears throat> okay, Regent Allen. Uh, Provost Sullivan, I want to thank you for a, a very rich report. Uh, uh, it's one of the reports I always keep handy. Uh, I want to thank you for taking us through the highlights of it and in particular for highlighting as you did the uh, coordinate campus uh, parts of it also. Uh, I want to call attention to something that I, if I missed it when you did it, uh, I apologize. I know you pointed it to us from last year. 
and that is the ACT scores of our science, technology, engineering, and mathematical students and how they rank. Uh, they ranked pretty well last year, and in this report, uh, 34 for the average ACT, and it ranks tied with the California Institute of Technology and a half a percent ahead of uh, MIT. Uh, I think it deserves highlighting. Thank you, uh, Ch Chair Allen and uh, 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 former Chair Allen and Chair <laughs> Cohen. Uh, right. We remember all of the great service of our former chairs. The ACT has been one of the remarkable success and progress, as, as you point out. Um, and um, uh, I'd also like to underscore the point with regard to uh, um, our National Merit Scholars. Um, when you look at that uh, standardized test score, the average for our now 2,500 honors students in the undergraduate program here. Now in our fourth year cohort, we will graduate our first class of honors students this May. Their ACT or SAT scores coming in rank them on average higher than literally any liberal arts college in the country. And in fact, when you look at the number 2,500 Wow, that's bigger than Carleton, that's bigger than McAllister, and I could go on with those numbers. But uh, your point's well taken, and we're, we're pleased we, we have work to do. Uh, as you look at other charts, um, many of our peer institutions uh, uh, started investing in this very important uh, metric before we did. Uh, so we've made great progress, but we have much work to do, as the President noted earlier in his remarks. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, uh, next, Regent Swiggum. Thank you, Chair. Do you remember oh. way back that you had a question? Yeah. <laughs> There's I, a long list. I'm not that old yet. That I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm about ready to touch 60, but I can, I, my memory is still at least a half hour. Right. Uh, Provost Sullivan, I've uh, seldom seen a performance report as positive as this one. Um, all numbers, every number, every trend here seems to be in the right direction. And uh, you should take some kudos for your team for that. Um, one question I have, and only because uh, this happens to be a, uh, a new requirement of the legislature, and some of their performance goals, which they have given to us uh, to meet, I think we have to report mm -hmm. next year, President Kaler. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a performance goal on uh, um, uh, regarding aid, uh, undergraduate aid. And, um, I see that we have dramatically increased the aid uh, for undergraduates. Um, again, it's one of the performance goals we have to report to the legislature on. Can you help break that down for me a little bit? Um, that aid, I'm assuming some of those, some of that aid is private dollars that we've raised, and some of that aid is internal university dollars, either raised, uh, either given monies that the legislature has given us or through tuition. Mm -hmm. Can you break that down for me? And I'm, I'm, the part I'm concerned about is how much do we raise tuition on all to give aid to some? And, and that's a direction that concerns me. And I, 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 can you break this down for me? Uh, Chair Cohen and Regent Swiggum, um, I'm, I'm reminded of your comment at the last board meeting, and it follows uh, uh, this one as well. I'll, I'll try to do that for you. Um, uh, on the sheet before you that I think you just mentioned and referenced, on the total gift aid of $137 million, that is pure dollars given to students in a scholarship form or similar manner uh, to recruit and to enroll. Total student aid under that at $322 million, that would be gifts as well as work study, as well as loans, as well as waivers. Waivers are when we say to a student in recruitment and enrolling, we will waive the tuition. This is frequently done if we're recruiting a non-resident. We will waive the non-resident tuition and they will come in and pay in resident. That's one of the definitions of a waiver. To your specific question, approximately 65 to 66 percent of our total financial aid pool comes from tuition and o and state dollars. The balance of a, a third or so would be uh, supported by private funds. Okay, 
Regent Frobenius. Thank you. Uh, this is an extremely informative report. The progress is spectacular. I'm sort of reminded of the discussions that occurred at the first strategic or the first planning retreat <laughs> that uh, Regent Simmons, Allen, and I attended when we talked about needing a need for a new strategic plan for the university with President Brunix at the time. And it's really a pleasure to see this results. I'm going to be a little bit like Regent Sviggum, though. I'm going to, you just tried to summarize on 143 pages of the most phenomenal data in the world, and I'm going to kind of drill down on one item out of that and try to get, suggest another little, little additional data item that might be helpful. I, too, try to sort of understand how we're doing as we travel down this road, quite frankly, to a high tuition, high aid model. Um, and it strikes me that one way that I could understand this better would be a comparison of, and I'm looking at page 18 of the document, um, uh, but again, looking at that total student aid number and, and seeing what the percentage of comparison that might be in both 05 and, o, and in 10 to what I would call gross tuition revenue. In other words, what's the total tuition revenue we charged undergraduates in 2005 and what percent of that is the 214 versus the same calculation in 2010? Sort of trying to get a figure of how we are keeping up with our total tuition charges with our generation of aid over time. It's a measurement that some of us in healthcare have used in our activity and I'm not asking you to calculate it now, but I'd be interested in that, seeing how that has evolved over time. I think the direction of that percentage change might be helpful to us in understanding how we're doing. Yeah, I think so. uh, Chair Cohn and uh, Regent Frobenius, uh, thank you for your question. Um, on page 18, while we don't have broken down specifically the way you've asked your question, I'll be happy to come back and, and give that level of detail. But um, on a page 18, on the bottom graph, you'll see um, the analysis with regard to cost of attendance. And I believe um, that net price of tuition, which you were asking about in relation to financial aid, the net price um, um, it has been about three, a 3% 3 increase in tuition, the net price, over that course of time. But we can give you the specific dollar amounts a, as we line up tuition and cost relative to the financial aid that we're providing. What I'm struggling with is are we keeping progress with generating, particularly with generating the outside student aid? But, um, anyway, appreciate anything you could give me on that. Yeah, I would just bring your, your attention to um, the last sentence in the second paragraph on the left-hand column of page 18. Since 2004-2005, the cost of attendance for a Minnesota resident undergraduate on the Twin Cities campus was 17,174 in 09-10, uh, and it was 22,000 during that period of time, and as I said, that net price, if you go down to the bottom graph there, that net price, I believe, is about a 3% increase over the course of time. Regent Ramirez. Thank you, Chair Cohen. Thank you, Provost Sullivan, for the report. Um, just wanted to highlight that part of the story there on raising the graduation rates is a good story. Graduation rates are going in the right hmm. direction. Uh, the in the document, page 34 shows your comparison of all students versus students of color graduation rates from 1996 and 2003. And while both groups of students have increased, there remains a persistent gap between student of color graduation rates and white and unreported student, of or student graduation rates. Uh, and the problem with those graduation rates on that list is also that we're at the bottom. In the, in the peer group for the Twin Cities campus. Um, there was not information on the coordinate campuses on student of color graduation rates, so as a separate request, I would be interested in that information. But just on this Twin Cities comparison group, can you help me it, and uh, maybe address if we're really comparing apples to apples when you say who a student is and looking at those graduation rates or uh, I, it's just something I want the board to be aware of as we continue to increase the number of students of color in the freshman class. 
our ability to graduate those students is worse than our ability to graduate white students, and that's going to be reflected in our graduation rates coming down the line if we're not able to address this persistent gap. Chair Cohn, uh, Regent Ramirez, uh, point well made. We still have a gap. Uh, we are working on that, and strategically we have been making investments through the strategic planning process in our program called Access to Success. I know you're aware of it because you've helped, helped guide that uh, uh, over the last several years. Uh, we, are, we are now in a position because we've had su sufficient enough cohorts of student coming through since that program went into effect in 2006 to be able to track, and we're seeing very significant progress. They're not showing up here yet in the longitudinal studies, but we're showing very significant progress for those students who come in um, with needing more preparation perhaps. Uh, putting them in our access to success programs that are spread across three different colleges. And uh, we're seeing real promise there towards retention and, and graduation rate. So I think as the reports come to you in the next several years, you're going to see some real progress there. It hasn't shown up yet because of the four and five year uh, matriculation. And uh, the graph on that uh, that attempts to depict that is on page 35. Regent Beeson. Thank you, Chair Cohen. Um, one, of the, one of the statistics I don't see in here is the average class size or median class size for undergraduate um, students. My intuition tells me we've been increasing the class size a little bit to help finance some of the money shortages, but I think it's important to have that data in here. Uh, um, at some point, it could affect our satisfaction ratings. Uh, and um, mm. do you, is there a reason that data is not in there? Chair Cohen, uh, Regent uh, Beeson, um, uh, we have provided on the sheet before you with regard to uh, total undergraduate uh, students. Um, um, on the Twin Cities campus, we can provide that also for the coordinate campuses. In 2004, that was 28,740 students. And uh, we are projecting for the class that just arrived, the total undergraduate enrollment of 30,000. Oh, sorry, for this, I meant the average class size. First year, second year? No, 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 I, I meant individual mm -hmm. classroom. 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 I'm sorry, I wasn't specific. Yeah. I'm sorry, we don't have that information here in the report. Um, I know you don't. My question is, why, do you have a sense whether that's gone up over the last 10 years? Uh, and and it's, it seems to me it's not, it's not unimportant to know what our class, individual class sizes are, median class sizes, because it, we, we don't want to get to a point where we've gone from 30. About 10 years ago, we started with, we went back and reduced class size, and now I, I, I don't know what the data is. That's the question I'm asking. Regent Beeson, uh, we actually have that data. It's not in this particular report. But I recall looking at it in the past year, and I was struck, uh, given the largeness of our university, 54,000 students on campus, the third or fourth largest university in the United States, I was struck by uh, how few classes we actually have with very large enrollments. We will bring that back to you, uh, the board, because, uh, but I just don't have it today, because um, it's a remarkable statistic. Uh, now, I did. Uh, expressed concern earlier when we were talking about the budget um, in past meetings that as we had to cut the budget by, in, in this case, 8 percent, that we might well see larger class enrollments because we are down on faculty because that's one of the places we took cuts. We don't have those numbers yet for this year, obviously. Uh, but I'll be happy to bring the data up till this point that we had. But I think you'll all be surprised, as I was, at how many classes we actually have with 25 or fewer students. Regent Larson, uh, you've been very patient. Pardon me? You've been very patient. Well, these guys are participative, huh? Right. I have a couple of questions and then a comment. Um, in looking at the data in regards to four, five, and six year graduation rates, Am I interpreting this correctly, that it would appear that if you don't graduate in five years, you're highly unlikely to ever graduate? Mm -hmm. 
There, uh, Chair Cohen and uh, Regent Larson, there is a significant drop-off after five. Uh, we're still capturing people graduating in six, but that's one of the reasons we're really focusing, as the President did in his orientation remarks to our new class, um, about the expectation of graduating in four years. Yeah. Um, if, in fact, my interpretation is, is correct, and you guys can affirm this, mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be smart of us to, when freshmen show up, when they show up and they get admitted, that we explain to them, the odds are extremely high that if you don't graduate in five years, you're not ever going to graduate. Let them have, you know, let them know about that. That the, That's what the track record would suggest, if I'm interpreting it properly. So just a suggestion. Uh, my second question is, how do we measure the graduation rates of transfer students as that appears to be a growing segment in our uh, student population? Uh, Chair Cohen, uh, Regent Larson, to your first point, if I could, um, the President hit that very hard in his orientation remarks to uh, our new class. Um, also, I would just uh, drop a footnote there. Um, uh, about a year ago, a new book came out, and we had a conversation with the board about this, particularly in the Educational Policy Committee, trying to get at this question of, of graduating in a timely way. A very thoughtful book. Um, the lead uh, author was the former president of Princeton University. And their conclusions, uh, even uh, 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 controlling for um, gaps in educational preparedness across all of those gaps that there may be. What that book showed was there are two things uh, that are directly correlated with graduating in four things. Two things and virtually only two things. Number one, the academic preparedness or the academic profile of the class coming in. And number two, and this was the President's point in his uh, orientation remarks, expectations that you will graduate in four years. And so the clarion call for the class of 2015, and we'll see you in four years at graduation as you walk up, that expectation, that ethos of when we arrive on campus, we know as a class we're going to march through and graduate in four years. We simply need to do a better job, and uh, perhaps in the past we haven't been as insistent or forceful, but I think we're more persuasive now. Uh, I'm very, very pleased to report that uh, scholarships targeted at core, uh, at kids that come from core middle class families, which is the group that's perhaps getting hurt the most by tuition increases, because typically <coughs> the income level of family is high enough they don't qualify for the Pell Grant, for one, and they also don't qualify for much state aid. But that, um, there's a group of about 200 of those students in the first classes graduating uh, this spring. And it would appear that it's been exceptionally successful in terms of uh, advancement towards a degree and so forth. And it has been, uh, approved, I mean, it's been improved upon rather significantly. And I think it's something that, um, with the leadership of Bob Burgett and Bob McMaster, um, we can show a real success story and sell that program to a number of other donors and significantly increase our uh, aid going to core, um, core kids who come from families that are core middle class because they're the ones that are taking on the most debt in most cases, and we could really be helpful to them, and then enable them to choose majors that they're passionate about instead of making financial decisions when they're 19 years old. So just a, just a, a comment and something that I think that we can really sell. Chair uh, uh, Cohen and uh, Regent Larson, if, if I could also take this opportunity to thank you for your leadership in this uh, very important area, as you identify, of 
of recruiting and supporting financially middle-income students. You've played a very significant role um, at our university. We try to address that point uh, on page 19 on the left-hand column for you and show the kind of progress, but, but thank you. All right, we're, one last comment, or, uh, and then we will move on to our next item. So, Regent Allen, you have the last say. <laughs> I was just going to call attention to something Provost Sullivan did. The president said in his orientation speech, open the white envelope, here's your tassel, hang it somewhere in the room, hang it on your roommate's, or on your computer, hang it on your roommate's nose, and wear it four years from now. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I... I Thank you, Regent Allen. I think there, there is a definite emphasis and expectation that's being built, which seems so important for the four-year graduation mm -hmm. rate. Obviously, Provost Sullivan uh, and your team, uh, there's been a lot of interest and conversation in this report, and so we thank you very, very much, and it will be for approval at our next meeting. We're now on to item 11, which is the resolution about legislatively required performance metrics. Uh, this is a review and action item today. And uh, first we'll call for a motion and then we'll have the presentation. Thank you. So it's been moved and seconded. And now discussion. Uh, President. Uh, thank you, Chair Cohen. Uh, if I may take a, a brief prerogative of a 30 second comment on the previous agenda item. You, you certainly may. Thank you so much. I, I uh, would like to uh, convey uh, my thanks uh, to not only the staff uh, and faculty who contributed to the report, but also uh, to the faculty and staff of the University of Minnesota. Uh, I talk about this being an excellent institution, and you need to uh, look no further than this report uh, to see why I so passionately believe that. Uh, we are delivering uh, on the investment the state of Minnesota makes in us uh, and on the tuition dollars that uh, families and students provide. Uh, this is an excellent place, and uh, the faculty and staff are delivering a uh, wonderful education to uh, uh, to our students, and I'm grateful for that. On to the uh, agenda item. Uh, you may recall uh, in the special session that the funding authorization for fiscal year 2013 uh, requires approval of specific numerical uh, indicators of uh, of uh, progress and performance by the university. Uh, in particular, uh, we are uh, required to meet uh, three of five performance goals. Uh, the narrative of this uh, discussion begins on page 113 of your uh, briefing book. Uh, the five performance goals are related to uh, institutionally provided financial aid to students, degrees awarded, uh, Twin Cities campus undergraduate graduation rates, research and development expenditures, and sponsored expenditures funded by business uh, and industry. Uh, we have collaborated uh, with the Minnesota Office of uh, Higher Education, uh, and I believe uh, Dr. Sheila Wright, the director of the Minnesota Office of Higher Education, is, is with us today. Uh, she may have had to leave earlier, I was told, but there may be a representative from the office here. In the back, yes, thank you. Um, we uh, have uh, worked with the, Min with the Minnesota Office of Higher Education to develop these uh, metrics uh, in a quantitative way. Uh, they are detailed for you in, uh, in the briefing book uh, with uh, very clear definitions beginning on page uh, 118 and 119 uh, about what qualifies as institutional financial aid uh, following the discussion uh, question of, uh, of Regents Figum. Uh, degrees granted uh, identified to be 13,500 across the Minnesota, um, University of Minnesota system. Uh, undergraduate uh, freshman graduation rates, the cohorts identified and numbers set to be uh, above those uh, of the previous year. Uh, NSF, uh, National Science Foundation R&D expenditures, those are documented and reported uh, by the National Science Foundation and uh, we track business and industry expenditures. Uh, we've identified the metrics, uh, the numbers we meet, uh, the time at which we will identify those, uh, uh, those metrics as the data is available, uh, and uh, we are uh, comfortable uh, with our ability uh, to meet uh, all five, not merely three, of these goals, and uh, commend the resolution to you for your approval. Okay, thank you, Mr. President. Are there comments or questions? Regent Simmons. This concept is, is new to me since I've been on this board, and I, I'm actually having some struggle. Um, I'm of two minds about it, and I want to help get some help in reconciling those, those two positions. One is, I think when there is any funding source or investment, there, it's appropriate to have some expectations set. 
um, when industry funds research or the uh, federal government funds research, uh, expectations are set to which we must perform. Uh, so that makes sense, of course, here. The, on the other hand, though, um, it concerns me to see uh, that at this board we set expectations. We're the governing body of this uh, institution that enjoys some degree of constitutional uh, autonomy. And when we have additional governing bodies set uh, expectations and performance metrics, they may not always be the same. Uh, as our so it does worry me and it's again it's sort of who's in charge uh, what is the governing body and this is at a time when we're seeing decreasing revenues coming from this particular source uh, as well so I, I have some concerns about this I'd, I think I'd like to hear the president respond certainly uh, chair Cohen uh, Regent Simmons uh, Indeed, uh, I, in fact, share your concern about the, the uh, autonomy uh, issues that this legislation raises. However, uh, I have been informed by our council that, in fact, when uh, these are attached to revenue allocations from the legislature, that these are, uh, are constraints that the state uh, can uh, put upon that funding stream. Uh, but I do share your discomfort with the, uh, uh, the potential uh, intrusion into our autonomous nature. May I, may, I, may I continue? Yes, and um, legally can and actually should, in terms of to, uh, good governance, are, would be two different things, and I might I would answer them differently. Um, I, I'll respect the law, of course, and and we may have no uh, alternative here. But I think this is an intrusion on the spirit of the law with respects to, to uh, autonomy, and I think that there are things I can imagine that would be very difficult um, for us to accept. Fortunately, the Board of Regents has to approve this document, and we, we probably will, but I, I have great concerns, and I think this is a bad direction. Thank you, Regent Simmons. Uh, Regent Broad. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I understand the concerns uh, related to, uh, you know, being forced to do certain measures or, or not being forced to do certain measures, but I think it comes out of a, uh, a certain um, uh, frustration with information flow and sharing that I think we have actually a tremendous opportunity by doing this to improve the relationship and to pr improve the transparency and information flow coming from the university, not just to the legislature, but to the people of this state through, uh, through you know, defining what the, what the metrics are, um, then communicating our performance on those metrics uh, in a variety of uh, places throughout the state. So um, I understand the frustration and the, and the concern, uh, absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult when, when money comes with strings. And I go back to the, the money that came with strings that required us to use stimulus, stimulus money in a way that probably uh, was difficult for the students to handle going forward. So I, I get the concern, and I too uh, often have uh, strong concerns over strings attached to whatever they are. Um, but I, I look at this a little bit separate from that concern in that this is an opportunity I think we truly owe not just the, not just the legislature but the people uh, to have these metrics available to the students, to the parents. Um, and so I'm actually excited about the metrics and I'm excited about the performance measures that we're really starting to focus in on. Um, and uh, so I, I actually support moving in, in this direction, not necessarily because we were told to, but because I think it's going to be good for us in the end. Regent Larson. Uh, I very much share uh, Regent Simmons' uh, concerns, and my question is of the President. When we made this agreement, was it our suggestion, or was it some of this forced on us? And that's what my concern is, is that to Regent Simmons' concern about you know, what is the governing board? I thought that's what we were elected for by them. And then when, uh, if, so if those things were imposed upon us, they, they not necessarily the same measures that the governing board would put in place and, and really emphasize. Uh, 
Regent Larson and, and uh, Chair Cohen, uh, I, I would simply reiterate my concern. Uh, these obviously uh, took place uh, uh, very early in my presidency in the conversation before then, uh, so I must admit to being uh, unclear uh, of the nature, but I do know that the request uh, was made uh, by the legislature. We certainly did not uh, seek to have these constraints on our funding. Uh, but we did have an opportunity to, in conversation to uh, define uh, what they are. And, and uh, uh, I will tell you that I am uh, very comfortable uh, with these performance goals, and I would certainly choose them myself uh, to measure the university by. Uh, but um, as an autonomous board, I think you are uh, correct to have a concern about the, this level of uh, strings. What I'm really concerned about is did we suggest the measures and and their and the, and they agreed to it or were any of them any of those measures imposed because that would really be dangerous in my opinion now if it's merely a kind of a, a compact if you will between university leadership and uh, people that are supplying us funding then I have less of a concern other than the, just the whole principle of, you know, autonomy. Uh, Regent Larson, Chair Cohen, as I mentioned, uh, my understanding is that we did have the opportunity for input into uh, these goals, uh, but the idea was the legislature's. Yeah. Okay, so the other comment that I have, if I may, uh, Chair Cohen, yeah. <clears throat> is, Going forward, it would appear to me that we may have a continuous growth in transfer students. And that may, that may become a very significant measure also. So if somebody starts at St. Cloud State or Normandale or whatever and goes for two years and then transfers here, they're just as important as someone who starts here in terms of their graduation rates. You know, and if, if that cohort, if you will, continues to grow, which I'm guessing that it might, and may, that may be good for the state too, um, then that's probably something we'll want to measure. Sure. Uh, yes, uh, Regent Larson, Chair, Chair Cohen. Uh, indeed, we are invested in the success of our transfer students uh, as we are in the first-year students. Uh, particular metrics around transfer students, though, are uh, considerably more difficult uh, to define uh, and measure. Uh, transfer students transfer at, at a variety of different levels and with different uh, backgrounds and preparations. Uh, they may uh, transfer to, uh, to achieve a change of major. Uh, the individualization necessary to track their success is, is really almost that. It has to be done on a person-by-person -person, uh, basis, uh, which I think is why uh, the federal government and others have, have uh, not been able to focus on transfer graduation success. Thank you. I want to just make one point of clarification uh, following up on your comment, Regent Broad. Uh, there are parts of it that I certainly agree with. I just want to make sure that that we're clear that the university has been measuring for 10 years and, and producing this accountability report so that I, I agree with you, I think measurement and metrics and data are very important. It's not that it's new and perhaps the opportunity here lies in our doing a better job of getting this information out to the legislatures and to, to the public. Uh, let's see, we have quite a long list here. Um, Regent Beeson. Well, Madam Chair, you took some of the words out of my mouth, which is that the, these um, five items are all areas that have been priorities here. They're, they're all areas that we have measured ourselves and that we've excelled at. So it, it's just unusual that these, these, uh, um, these items would be ones that, that, um, that, that you know, we need to be held accountable for since we've been doing that well through and as demonstrated through our accountability report and through so much other information. So I don't know if this is a communication problem or what it is, but it, it you know, I'm just, I'm just concerned about the content of the request. Regent Sviggum. 
Chair, I don't want to prolong this, but I, I don't share the concerns of my friends here on the Board of Regents. I don't share them at all. In fact, these are the same questions I asked every president in my room for the last 28 years when I was in the legislature. I, I think it's a accountability not to the legislature. I think it's to the higher body, to the citizens of the state. And if we've got a great story to tell, I don't see any problem in telling it. Or if we don't have a great story to tell, maybe we shouldn't go. We don't have to worry. Of if we don't go ask for $600 million a year and $300 million in bonding authority a year, we don't have to worry about it. But uh, there is an accountability that does come with financial obligations. Regent Simmons. There is no question about accountability to the people of Minnesota. This board is accountable to the people of Minnesota. This is a step that puts the legislature in between that, uh, in my opinion. And I'd like to know the, um, the implications of passing this resolution or failing to pass this resolution. And I'd also like to comment on the unfortunate timing that we couldn't have a robust discussion and then another alternate, uh, another time to take action. President Kaler, do you want to address that one? Sure, Regent Simmons, Chair, Chair Cohen. Uh, the timing is, is indeed uh, unfortunate. The statute requires this uh, by uh, October 1 of 2011, and, uh, and the law was passed in the, uh, in the special session, of course, in the middle of July, uh, not allowing uh, a board, um, a scheduled board meeting to, to review this. Um, the risk, uh, I think, is the statutory risk, which is that 1 percent of our, our funding in fiscal 2013 would be uh, at risk. That's $5 million, approximately. Uh, and and the, the risk uh, you are speaking about, of course, is, is one of, um, uh, of broaching the line of uh, autonomy and uh, one of significant uh, governance. Uh, I will say that I'm freely um, more than willing uh, to be held accountable and intend to, to provide uh, transparency and information to the people uh, of the state of Minnesota and their elected representatives. And I will, uh, going forward, uh, work to uh, not have uh, this kind of, of, um, of activity uh, crossing the line of, of governance. So philosophically, uh, I share your, your point of view. Uh, and I also agree with, uh, with Regent Sviggum and Regent Broad that uh, we need to be accountable to the people of the state. And we should be doing that at, at a frequency and at a level uh, that uh, does not rely, require legislative guidance. Exactly. Okay. Regent Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. This issue of autonomy and constitutionality is a very difficult issue. We had a work group uh, a couple years ago looking at the autonomy issue. And it's uh, just a naughty little issue between the legislature and the Board of Regents. Uh, Regents Swigum and uh, Broad, you know, the accountability, the metrics, the benchmarks are all important. At the same time, we kind of bristle up as board thinking, are they going to, what are they going to tell us next to do? So, Mr. President, I have a question of you. Have you asked legal counsel the constitutionality of this statute as it relates to the Board of Regents? Uh, I have had that conversation. I don't know if uh, our general counsel, Rodenberg, is in the room or not. I do not see him coming forward, so I will assume not. Uh, but his uh, um, advice uh, on this is that uh, when it's, it's related to a funding stream, that this kind of, of constraint on funding uh, is within the law. Regent Ramirez. Thank you, Chair Cohen. My Concerns are similar to Regent Simmons, and my question was similar to Regent Johnson's, uh, bringing this before us without having had the advice of the general counsel makes me a little bit nervous. I was on the autonomy work group. I don't remember this coming up as something that the legislature was allowed to do. That could be my understanding of the material that we covered. Uh, Mr. President, what's, what's the precedent here this year we're saying uh, if we would pass this, we would say, okay, this year 1% of our funding can be tied to these performance goals. What's to stop them from coming back next year and saying actually 100% of your funding is going to be based on you meeting these performance goals? And then what kind of a situation are we in? 
Uh, Regent Ramirez and Chair Cohen, um, I think you you have hit the proverbial nail on the head. That's that's the uh, the risk uh, that uh, uh, that this uh, represents. Uh, again, I think uh, our relief from that is is being accountable and being transparent about uh, what we are doing. Uh, but um, your your uh, fear is certainly one that uh, that could become realized. I, this is certainly a topic that people are heavily invested in, so I have four names on the list, and I'm not going to add more just because of our timing that we need to be done on time. So in this order, it will be Regent Allen, Regent Swiggum, Regent Broad, and Regent Simmons. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. It, it strikes me that the, the issue of autonomy and, and lack of autonomy is a very large issue. Uh, we aren't going to settle that today. Uh, this, to me, is a very small and a practical item. Uh, if the legislature had asked for this data uh, in the course of discussions on the budget uh, and asked every year instead of putting it into uh, legislation, we'd be supplying it. It's, uh, it's, it's practical data. Uh, my recollection is the accountability report itself goes back to a legislative request years ago. So, uh, you know, we're dealing with some differences without a distinction here almost. I feel very strongly about the autonomy issue on many issues. I just think this is a very, very small part of that, and perhaps the best we do today is express our concerns about that general issue, uh, because this is really a small item on, on that whole agenda, I think. Uh, Regent Swiggum. Uh, thank you, and Chairman, Regent Allen, I couldn't echo what you said better. Pick your fights. This is nothing to pick a fight about because we have a great story to tell. We want to tell everybody about the story about the university. The risk members is not 1% of our funding. That, that's not the risk. The risk is our relationship with the legislature and the citizens of Minnesota into the future. We just came off, friends, we just came off a retreat in July in Owatonna where one of our goals was, if I remember correctly, and I won't have the right words, was to it enhance our relationship with the governing body of the legislature and others. That was one of our goals, and we, we spent minutes, hours on it, making sure that that was one of our goals. The consequence is a destroying of the relationship over something that ain't worth picking a fight with because we got a great story to tell. It's, it's a region broad. Madam Chair, I'll just ask a question because I agree with both of the last statements uh, strongly. Um, my question, uh, Mr. President, is related to how we're going to communicate this information, which, whether you like it or not, we're, we're going to give to the legislature, but also to the people of, the, of Minnesota. Is it, is it something that we can put out on a website? Is there already a transparency page out there that we add these bullet points to? Uh, this appears to be good information, so how do we scream it? Uh, well, there is, uh, I'm sorry, Regent uh, Broad and Chair Cohen, uh, I happen to think that the uh, ability of the university to transmit uh, good news is already pretty good. Uh, what I seem to struggle with is getting people to read it. So uh, we, we will, uh, we should mandate it, yes. Uh, we will uh, we'll work hard uh, to, to continue to drive these points home. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the performance reports are, are freely available uh, online. Uh, as I've said, we have a great story to tell. Uh, we'll work at telling it more effectively and, and distilling uh, these things down to, um, to elevator speeches. Even though I totally believe in gender equity, I'm going to take the prerogative of a female and change what I said in that there are, there are two regents who didn't have a chance to speak to this topic who have indicated that they had wanted to, and I didn't see that. So I'm going, if they still want the opportunity, Regent Frobenius and then Regent Hung and then Regent Simmons is our final, and I won't change my mind on that. I think it's time to be practical and support this action and blow it out of the saddle and go on to about our business. Regent Hung, did you have a comment? Thank you, Chair Cohen. I'm sharing the concerns that many of the regents have about the principle of this resolution. And given that many of our retreats, we've talked about the autonomy of the board and the slippery slope we run by continuing to pass resolutions where we're allowing other people to creep into the scope of our authority, I'm not going to be supporting this resolution today. Okay, thank you. And Regent Simmons. Uh, thank you. And I won't be supporting this uh, resolution today. And I regret 
the situation we are, are forced in having to make that choice. It is not a request for data as much as it, it does state that this is meeting performance goals. A request for data um, we should always honor and we have and our accountability report is an example and if different kinds of data is requested we can provide it we will we wouldn't we should never withhold that but this is requesting and holding funding contingent upon uh, meeting specifically set goals so i can't support that all right it's time for a call for the vote and so uh, we've had a motion and a second all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. and opposed all right. Okay, I think I've got three no's, so the motion has passed. All right, we are on to our committee reports. Um, and uh, the first one is the report of the Faculty, Staff, and Student Affairs Committee, Chair Simmons, Chair of that committee. Regent Simmons. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> The, uh, I'm sorry, I, uh, the Faculty, Staff, and Student Affairs Committee report I'm pleased to give. Um, with respect to action items, I would like to, uh, on behalf of the committee, unanimously recommend approval of our consent report, which includes um, a approval of the Faculty Emeritus title for retired Professor George Noren and conferral of tenure to two to five faculty members who've recently been hired by the University of Minnesota. I move approval. Sorry. Is there a Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, the committee had three discussion items without action. One was on human resource foundational data. The purpose of this item is to educate our committee about what our workforce is um, in, in more functional terms than some of the categories we've looked at before. I think that foundation of information is going to help us very much um, make decisions uh, uh, that support our, our important HR needs. The second item is that we discussed certain highlights relevant to the work of our committee from the University Plan Performance and Accountability Report. I thought I'd just present all of that right now, but um, Regent Fabinius gave me an elbow. And finally, we discussed our work plan and continually tried to align that to the pre President's priorities and to the Board of Regent priorities. That concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, next, the report of the Finance and Operations Committee, the region for Thank you, Chair Cohen. Um, the committee unanimously recommends approval of the consent report, which includes purchases of, of goods and services $1 million and over, and an amendment to the agreement uh, between Gopher Sports Properties and the university, which was a item that came in late in the docket material, but which was uh, information was provided to all of our committee and to all of the board members uh, prior to our meeting. I move the approval of the consent uh, agenda with the, uh, the consent report with the amendment. Is there a second? second? Thank you. Any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Uh, the committee also discussed and received information on the annual asset management report, which is in page 36 of your docket materials. And I should note that that reflects many of the additional elements of performance um, and parameters of the uh, Consolidated Endowment Fund promised in action taken by this board last spring. Uh, so we spent a goodly amount of time on that topic. We dealt with the amendments. We reviewed in depth the amendments to the annual operating budget for fiscal year 12. Uh, highlights from the University Plan Performance and Accountability Report including a particular review of financial ratios, expanding the ratios that are targeted by the U and considering continuing that dialogue within our work plan for the coming year. We did approve a, a revised work plan after some significant discussion. Uh, we will uh, work within the shortened agenda or the meeting parameters, but uh, include such items as a lot of work on long range financial planning, program costing, administrative cost discussion that has been about, uh, maybe revisiting some of the elements of the PeopleSoft activity and a few other uh, programs. So uh, uh, it's an ambitious work plan for our committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. That concludes my report. Thank you, Regent Frobenius. Uh, report of the Audit Committee, Regent Beeson. Thank you, Chair Cohen. The committee uh, discussed and received information on three non-action items. First was its internal audit program year to date. Second was the independence of the internal audit function 
at the University of Minnesota. And third was the committee's comprehensive 2011-2012 work plan. Thank you for the report. And the report of the Educational Planning and Policy Committee, Regent Ramirez. Thank you, Chair Cohen. The committee had one action item, our consent report. The committee unanimously recommends approval of the consent report, which includes two new academic programs and a number of academic program changes. I move its approval. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Under non-action items, the committee also received the annual report on undergraduate, graduate, and professional academic program changes, which summarizes 2010-2011 academic program changes, reviews their alignment with strategic position goals and academic program review criteria. Uh, we also discussed issues related to the university plan, performance, and accountability report. We received highlights, had a further discussion on graduation rates and retention rates, seeing the significant growth in research dollars, and noted the university is a big research university, especially in comparison to the size of the state's population. Uh, following that, we discussed and by consensus agreed to a committee work plan for the coming year. Uh, Madam Chair, that ends my report. Thank you. The report of the Facilities Committee, Regent Johnson. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, members. I uh, have seven or eight motions to make, so uh, I'll go through these as rapidly as I can. Okay. Uh, Here we go. <laughs> uh, the committee unanimously recommends approval of the purchase of the following real estate transaction, purchase of 724 First Avenue Southwest Rochester in regard to the Rochester campus. I move approval of this transaction. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, schematic plans. The committee unanimously recommends approval of schematic plans for the following project, the St. Anthony Falls Laboratory Twin Cities Campus. I move approval of the schematic plans. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Capital budget amendments. The committee unanimously recommends approval of a number of amendments to the 2012 annual capital budget. The first, the result of the legislative action, the governor's signature in July. Higher education asset preservation replacement project system wide. I move approval of this capital budget amendment. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed? Thank Motion you, Madam carries. Chair. Uh, next is the Physics and Nanotechnology Building in the Twin Cities Campus. I move approval of this capital budget amendment. Second. Been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Central Corridor Laboratory Mitigations on the Twin City Campus. I move approval of this capital budget amendment. Second. And it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion and carries. And fourthly, one ref the fourth reflects a large federal grant to the University of Minnesota that uh, was uh, sent forth and approved. It's the Center for Magnetic Resonance Research uh, Imaging on the Twin Cities campus. I move approval of this capital budget item. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. Uh, Madam Chair, non-action items. The committee reviewed a capital budget amendment for the following project. The cardiology department building infrastructure systems upgrade. I, this item will return for action at a future meeting of the committee. The committee also discussed the four items, discussed issues relating to the 2012 state capital budget request. Second of all, discuss, discuss strategic issues related to the university plan performance and accountability report, which we did at this board meeting. Uh, most of our time, Madam Chair, was to receive an excellent facilities condition assessment. And for members that are not on the facilities uh, committee, they have now provided staff uh, for all the buildings uh, system-wide. And I would uh, I think staff would, could provide it to you but all the conditions of our, our buildings uh, system-wide and uh, when they were built, square footage, and uh, I think there's five categories of conditions of these buildings and it's very informative uh, information and that uh, is for your information only. 
Finally, uh, discussed and by consensus agreed to the 2011-12 committee work plan. Madam Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you very much. And it does look as though that would be important information for each region to, to have. And our last committee report of the Litigation Review Committee, uh, Regent Hung. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Litigation Review Committee met first in public session on September 9, 2011, and discussed the annual report on legal matters, and then met, met in closed session to discuss attorney-client privilege matters. No actions were taken. That concludes my report. Right, thank you. Is there any old business? any new business. Before we adjourn, I just want to thank each of the board members. I think we had very thoughtful discussion. I think one of the things we talked about at our retreat, which uh, you mentioned, uh, Regent Sviggum, but that we want to be able to have very good discussion uh, with differing points of view and listen to each other's points of view and understand them. And I appreciate that you all were uh, showed a lot of candor in your comments and appreciate the good discussion. If there's no further business, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>